Hey everyone, how's it going? Welcome to uh, Know Your Gear QA podcast number 195. Closing up on 200 episodes. I'm pretty excited about that. And uh, we'll have to figure out what to do about 200 episodes. Also closing up on 300,000 subscribers, which is also, I think, uh, another milestone. Seems like it. Feels like it. Uh, If you're new to the show and this is your first time catching it live, please put a question mark first to let me know that you're talking to me. That way, if I see your your comment or question, I know it's directed at me. If you're watching the rebroadcast, of course, I timestamp and index all the questions and topics we talk about. And if you're listening to it as a podcast on iHeartRadio or iTunes or what have you, just sit back and la- and listen, laugh, maybe laugh too. But also, um, if I you know can describe what I'm pointing to, sometimes I'll try and do that as well. All right. So I hope everybody had a good week. I actually had a pretty decent week. I'm going to share some stuff different than I've done shows in the past. I need to share some some stuff. I'm going to start with some excitement. And the reason why is because just like sometimes I share some stuff at the end because the diehard viewers stay to the end, I think the diehard viewers viewers are also at the beginning. So, well, first I want to share some good news with you. I, I wasn't sharing with anyone, but I went to the doctor a couple weeks ago, had a little bit of a scare. Looks like that is all good news. Um, and when I say it looks like, seems like I had a, uh, I went to back to the doctor yesterday. They had me freaked out. They had me doing like 20 kinds of tests. They were concerned, surgeries, you name it. So anyways, I just want to say it looks good so far. Everything looks on the, on the good thing. So I just want to share good news. Uh, like I said, I'm pretty relieved by it. I think the family's relieved by it, but, but I got to tell you what happened to me yesterday because it is pretty freaking epic. <laughs> so as you guys know, uh, you know, last year, 2020, besides all the horrible things you can imagine in a, in a freaking year, we lost Eddie Van Halen and uh, it, it hit a, a lot of us hard. And uh, one of the one of my uh, friends, I'm going to call him friend, one of my friends that was hit hard by it was Larry DiMargio of DiMargio Pickups. And I told you guys on some podcasts before that during the pandemic, uh, which, you know, is still going on, but during the lockdowns and stuff, uh, the heavy lockdowns, uh, Larry uh, Wilson, who works at DiMargio as well, and I had talked on many calls and just shared stories and just talked about the industry and, you know, and all kinds of, lots of conversations, hours, sometimes four hours on the phone, hanging out, talking about guitars. And one of those conversations was basically a four-hour Van Halen discussion where uh, Larry shared with me the time that he was asked to take photos of Eddie in 1989 before a concert and during the concert. And if you guys don't know, I've, I, if you don't know my five things you don't know about DiMaggio pickups, you'll know in that video I tell you guys, Larry DiMaggio is not only the guy who invented the first aftermarket pickup and makes DiMaggio pickups, he is a photographer, a professional one who's done uh, dozens of covers for Guitar World. He's an amazing photographer. So he says, hey, I got a gift for you. And he sent it to me and it showed up yesterday. And I'm going to share it with you because I know I shared some show and tell stuff and I don't want to be all braggy all the time. Uh, but this is uh, this is pretty freaking amazing. So let me share it with you. First, I'm going to share the box because <laughs> I want you to experience this. I, maybe, maybe uh, uh, you know, you guys can experience it virtually. So Bigger screenshot. Look at that. We're like almost professional around here. This box is huge. <laughs> it says Phil on it. Now, when I say it's huge, it's flat and huge. And it says Phil upside down on this. <laughs> so these listening. So I get this giant, fragile, giant box or, you know, that's, you know, half an inch thick and huge. And I go, what's in this? And I'm about to show you. Ready? Here we go. He took the actual 35 millimeter uh, film that he took the photos with that day and he made me 13 by 19 inch prints and I'll change camera angle so you can see close up Uh, and and there's more there's more I'm gonna obviously make sure they're safe I'm sorry I didn't take them out of the plastic I'm afraid to I hope you guys understand okay I hope you understand that I don't want to damage them I'm having them framed he signed them to Phil from Larry DiMaggio. Here's one of, and again, close shot of the guys on stage. I know it's reflecting. And again, I apologize for, this is a picture of, of course, of Anthony, Eddie, and Sammy on stage. This is black and white. I'm saving the best for last, by the way. I promise. There's, here's another picture. 
This one is Eddie and Sammy on stage. Now, this is a, a very important thing. If you notice that uh, he's playing the Music Man, right? Yep, the Music Man uh, guitar. That's the first Eddie Van Halen, which, as you guys know, has DiMaggio pickups in it. Okay, you ready? Go for the wide shot on this, and I'll bring it in. This is the picture, guys. Look at this. He said, to Phil, you're cool. I think he says, you rule. I rule. He says, I rule. Larry DiMaggio, this is a picture. This is my favorite Eddie Van Halen uh, picture of all time. Obviously, him jumping in the air. Uh, why? Because I think at this point, at 1989, I think Eddie's like 40 <laughs> Ish, maybe not so, not that, not quite. I'd have to look it up again, you know, right? Uh, or do the math. But you guys get the idea. This is just impressive, and uh, reminds us. And uh, obviously, my wife agreed because she's amazing to not only let me frame them, uh, but to hang them in the family room. <laughs> So I wanted to share that with you. I know that's like a braggy thing. I, I don't feel too great about that part. I don't want to be like, look at me, but it, man, uh, it was just perfect timing. I came home literally from the doctor's office like, oh, I'm everything seems okay-ish. And again, not 100%, 95%. Not just because one last thing to check to make sure, but they think I'm good. And, and then this package. So if that doesn't start a great show, I hope... Uh, I don't know what's going to start a great show. I hope that puts you in a mood, a great mood. Those are great pictures. Uh, fantastic. And uh, it's, a, it's a piece of history. I literally got a, a piece of history. Thank you, Larry. Um, and uh, thank you, guys. All right. So on that note, on the, some positivity, let's uh, let's keep the positivity going. And, uh, and uh, we have a lot of subjects, obviously questions to answer, a lot of subjects. But I, of course, like always, some of you guys are early to the show and I pinned some of your questions and I got a bunch. I'm not doing them in order, as you hope you understand. But, uh, but um, hold on. There's so many good ones that are already early subjects, questions. But there was one in particular I want to hit because there's an advantage to coming early and asking me a question. One, not only is it very likely that I'll answer it, which is good, especially if, you know, you want to make sure I answer a question. Hold on. <laughs> it's so important I didn't. Okay, there's another one. I think it's the way I screen grab these that it doesn't let me see it. So the question is... Again, I apologize, guys. I actually thought I had put it aside, but it looks like I, I haven't. Okay, so if I can't find it, I'm going to do it off memory. So I apologize to whoever, whoever answered the question. I'll give it again one second. I hate to start the show and already be kind of a mess like this, but but I will re refine the um, the screen grabs so that I do have them in the order I need them. Okay, I found it. All right. All right. The rest are no problem. This is the only one I made sure because... All right. So Charlie sent a question early before the show. And because he did that, I was able to go downstairs in my shop and grab something. So the question was, hey, Phil, I have a Music Man Stingray 4 string bass with a satin neck. Okay. And it says the last owner put some permanent marker on the maple wood to see uh, the frets better. Okay. Uh, when standing up, uh, how can I remove the black marks? Now, of course, you can try all kinds of, uh, of, of cleaners and stuff. On, uh, uh, but there's a method I use to remove Sharpies off of guitars. A lot of times uh, when you're in a repair shop, believe it or not, one of the questions or one of the, the things that people have you do is remove signatures. Let's say you buy a guitar. And let's say you go into a guitar center. You see a cool guitar. Uh, let's say it's a, you know, a Mexican Strat. It's, it's 250 bucks. It looks like a good deal, but it's got this signature. And you're like, I don't know who this guy is. And they go, oh, it's Phil McKnight superstar on YouTube and you go yeah I don't want that that just devalued the guitar you need to remove it so how you remove sharpie from guitars how I remove sharpie uh, permanent marker from uh, the bodies of guitars this the the polyurethane guitars is believe it or not I trace it with any kind of of uh, erasable marker so you just trace the sharpie and then wipe it off with a microfiber cloth what I didn't know 
And his question was, he said it's a satin neck. So um, I have, it literally says test neck on this. I have a bunch of necks, like this one's missing a fret. Um, if you've seen videos where I show you guys how to remove a dent on a fretboard, I have a ton of necks that I've gotten over the years that literally I abuse, <laughs> right? I test them before I test them on customers' guitars. I try not to do crazy stuff. And a lot of you guys are saying Gooby Gone. Might work perfectly. But uh, I, I know this works. I just don't know about this. So what we're going to do on the show live is try it. I'm going to write a big P here on the on the uh, fourth fret, as you guys see there, and uh, let it dry. Now, here's what I won't know, okay? Obviously, sometimes, sometimes, the, the longer something stays on something, especially Sharpie, the more impregnated it gets. Um, but my experience, Sharpie doesn't get too much worse than before. So you can see it's not smudging. I feel pretty good about it. I'd like to let it sit for a little bit longer, but again, it's a live show and I don't need people sitting for six hours. Those listening, I just wrote a, a, a Sharpie. I took a letter P, put it on the fourth fret. This is just a, a, a erasable marker. It's in colors. It doesn't matter if it's colors or black. And then what I would do is just trace it. And again, and just trace it. Okay. And then you can use any cloth you want. I like for this, the microfiber as well. There's no chemicals or anything. This is a dirty cloth because I'm just going to use a dirty cloth. I don't want to clean it. Just go ahead and wipe it. And you'll see it's starting to come off. And then you'll see now it's faded. Okay, so now we faded it. Let's go ahead and trace it again. And again, don't worry about where it goes. Get you know. In fact, if you don't even have to be, you know, you can just be crazy with it. Just... Go outside the lines. Try to go with the grain. I find that works better. And now you see it's not gone, but you can see it's faded pretty, pretty good. And this today's show is the new cameras. So we're looking at a much crisper image. And I would do it one more time again. And then I would use Gooby Gone or F1 oil for sure. Any kind of cleaner like that on the maple. And again, let it sit for a second. And you can let it dry for a second. I don't, you don't need to. And again, just use a little force. Use the clean part of the cloth. And I'm going to get really close on there. Let's pay attention to that right there. And a little light. I want you to see. There you go. You can see a little bit in the grain, a little bit of that ink in the grain. Looking at it personally right now, like I can't tell from, from this distance. I mean, it's hard to tell. Um, you can see the little bit of the haze of the piece. See that? But like I said, a little bit of cleaner, a little bit of oil, you'd remove that. Uh, so that's what I would recommend to do that. But like I said, that's a great trick. It's been used by shops around the world many times over. Super, super easy. Get you really, really close. And then, like I said, clean anything ex extra off that. And the F1 oil stuff, I think, works great for Music Mad. Music Nomad. Music Mad. <laughs> music Mad. They should, Music Nomad should change their name to Music Mad. So, uh, um, uh, let's see. Um, what else? <laughs> Next question. Let's do the next one. There was a bunch of great ones. Not only were they early, but they were really good questions. So let's see what they are. Um, this was the actual very first question of the show. And uh, it was from uh, Mitchell who said, I'm starting to think tone is some magical beast like a unicorn or Bigfoot. Okay. I often don't hear much difference in, in different people's tones. Am I right? So look, after after 2020, I think we could all agree that there is a possibility that the unicorns and Bigfoots not only could exist, but there could be an actual Bigfoot unicorn that we have to worry about. I'm not, I'm not, I'm not, I'm not, I'm not, uh, <laughs> I'm not crossing anything out of my list now in this crazy world. I've, there's definitely anyone who entered into 2020 as I've seen it all has had to recant that statement. So, okay. So first the unicorn Bigfoot thing, sure. We'll be open to it. But the core of your question is, is tone some kind of mis mystical beast? In other words, he doesn't hear it. I think that's the, the story we grew up with is the emperor's new clothes, right? The, the con men, again, it's a story I haven't heard since I was a little kid or since I read it to my kids when they were little. You know, the con men sells the, the emperor nothing, right? The emperor's walking around naked because he's he says, oh, look how great your invisible clothes are. I, I, I felt that way so many times in my life um, with all kinds of artists, so you know, um, and guitar builders, <laughs> you know what I mean? You're talking to them and they're like, oh, you hear the difference? And I'm like, no, yes. You know, <laughs> what, wait, what, what? Yes. <laughs> and, uh, so I, I think everyone has felt that way. Um, like, you know, yeah, 
<laughs> Somebody's like, you hear the difference between this this uh, this toothpick <laughs> shoved into the to the tuning key and this toothpick? You know, right? Just all kinds of weird stuff. And um, here's what I think. I think there's sure there's a placebo. We all agree. I've said it many times on many of my videos. I've even said when I hear things, I say it could be a placebo. I'm I'm very aware of the fact that it could be fake. Of course, but luckily it's not important. <laughs> so here's what I mean by that. Uh, Believing something is safe and it's not is dangerous. <laughs> Believing something sounds slightly different and then finding out later it's not, eh, you know what I mean? Who hasn't done that? Who hasn't bought uh, a really good coffee grain, uh, uh, bean, or a really good, uh, you know, mustard or some kind of thing? And you're like, this is the best. And then one day you find out, oh, it's the store brand repackaged as, you know, something premium. It happens, right? Uh, you can't go on YouTube, not just not even the gear channels, go on YouTube and just watch all the amazing videos of these, you know, uh, really amazing chefs do taste tests between cheap food and expensive food. And sometimes it's legit and sometimes it's not. So the, you know, is the tone thing real? It is real. It get does get exaggerated. And of course, and everybody has to draw that line for themselves personally. Me, I've said it many times uh, that in my personal world of me, sometimes uh, customers have asked me to do things and there's certain things I just don't hear, even though they request me to do it. One of the most common things that I do uh, repair that I do that I just, I, it's not that I don't hear it, I just don't feel or I'm not connected to it in the way the, the consumer is, the customer, is modding bridges with heavier mass bridges. This is obviously with the tone blocks on tremolos, but really, really interesting in the bass world, right? I I have replaced enough Fender bass bridges with badass bridges, <laughs> you know, and played it before and then played it afterwards. And every time, I think, uh, I feel nine out of 10 times, it's probably 10 out of 10 times, the customer comes in, plays and goes, man, man, thanks, Phil. You rocked it. This thing sounds so much better. And every time I've always told them like, uh, you know, <laughs> sure. I don't know. I, I don't know if I hear it. Maybe it's more sustained. I don't know. So again, uh, I, I like this conversation though. I hope you guys do too. I think it's nothing wrong with being skeptical of all this stuff, but also don't get upset. That's the thing that I always watch. That's the thing I don't understand. You know, what's the difference in tone between basswood and rosewood? And then you start talking about what you think and somebody's like, this is crazy. And you go, eh, it's crazy, but what else are you going to talk about? <laughs> so, um, so there you go. That's my answer. Is is uh, is tone a, a mythical be a magical beast? No, it's not magical. Um, does it exist? Sure, of course. And is most tones that we say are different the same? Sure, <laughs> absolutely. So uh, if you notice, on I, at least I don't know. I, I, it's one of those things. Sometimes I don't maybe read things the same way as everybody else. I don't look at my channel as a tone channel. Like I. I, I try comparing things and I talk about stuff, but my channel is more of a, like just dissecting or listening to the theory of it. I don't necessarily quest over it. Like I don't go, oh my, you know, I'm not questing so much that the tone be a certain way. I just like to know, you know, stuff, what's fun and different. I like to know what's different. Um, Okay, so I, another preloaded question, and again, then I'll hit some super chats, and, and I'll come back to some preloaded questions. Uh, this is from DP DBPWN in Cincinnati. Uh, he says, uh, or they say, uh, "Hey Phil, newbie guitar player here. Any recommendations on a first guitar pedal effects to buy so I can explore tone?" Sure, I would highly recommend the Line Six M5. I put a link in the description already, and it's a, it's a, it's a if you click it, you know, and you buy any of those, I'll get 1% of the sale from Reverb. Uh, so that is, yes, you're doing the math. I get like a dollar 40, which is pretty good. Maybe a dollar 20. So I don't think I get that much, but I get close to the, uh, don't, don't feel, don't feel free to, or don't feel like you have to do that. I'm just giving you guys the, 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 the information. Um, the M5 is my favorite pedal for anyone who wants to get into pedals. Why? It's not just a processor. It has a hundred different pedals in it. It has a really good variety of pedals. And some of those uh, pedals in it are some of my favorite pedals. Some of the compressors in there, some of the reverbs in there and delays are really, really good. And I enjoy them. And uh, what I like about it is uh, it's 140 ish dollars, right? Maybe 150 new if you can't pick one up used. But, uh, 
Uh, it literally does so many pedals that you'll get a taste of it. And if you go online, you can actually see which pedals they're copying. So if you end up finding like, you like the red comp, that's the MXR. If you like the blue comp, that's the boss. And the other thing that's nice about it is when you decide to start buying some of those pedals, this thing doesn't become obsolete. You still have it as a, hey, I always wanted a you know envelope filter, but I don't want to spend $150 on an envelope filter. If the only reason I'm, uh, I would not recommend that is if, 150 bucks seems like a lot and you need to stay cheap, then at that point, just start buying used pedals. A lot of people recommend inexpensive pedals, like little cheap, cheapy pedals, uh, you know, all these little cheap pedals you can find online. Uh, no, if you're going to buy pedals and experiment, stay used because they hold the value. If you buy a hundred dollar pedal used for $60, it's still worth $60. Throw it on Craigslist and those pedal cheap pedals will move on Craigslist, even on Craigslist. <laughs> you know what I mean? Uh, that's usually the, an easy thing to unload. So that's something to do. And then Johnny Chase is saying hey, line six M9. The M9, of course, is just an expanded M5, just like the M13. Obviously, I like the M5, so I love the M9 and I love the M13. Um, but the M5 is the just one pedal trick. Do some research, like uh, you know, just because Johnny mentioned it, it's a good mention. The M9 is a little nicer and it's not much more expensive. Check these things out, but that's the way I would go um, with that, and that's a great first pedal. I think anybody would ha be happy with that pedal. Um, <laughs> and I just said anybody will be happy with it on the internet. Am I crazy? Five people right now just got triggered. All right, two people, because there's two thumbs downs already. All right. Um, <laughs> okay, so let me, uh, just so I want to get the Super Chats backed up, let me hit some Super Chats. I also have some Super Chats from last week, and don't worry if you Super Chat me last week after I said, you know, don't Super Chat me, or if you heard that, uh, I have them pinned. We'll hit those as well. And uh, let me refresh this and just get right to them. Let's do it. Somewhere in this mess. Oh, and I should have turned my... I apologize. Very unprofessional to leave my ringer on. Okay. <laughs> okay. Let's do this. The first one, uh, Super Chat, was Mr. Fancy Hands. Hey, hey Mr. Hans Fancy Hands from last week as well. Uh, if I had only ever played Cheap Squires. So the question is to me, he's asking me, if I've only ever played, in theory, if I only had played Cheap Squires from the 80s and picked up a better quality modern guitar, what differences would I notice straight away? Um, so obviously I'm, I, I think for some reason I can't really explain this part of it, but I want to go into it. There's something about new guitars and old guitars, period. It doesn't matter when they're made or where they're made. There's something about the way guitars are made in the, when I say new guitars, let's say 2000, 2000, you know, forward to pre 2000. And then of course, then probably again, pre seventies where guitars have a feel to them that just feels different. It's like you can tell the CNC machines from when they were more hands-on and the 80s was going to be definitely a lot of a lot of pre-CNC so you're going to be templated routered, you know, templates and stuff. There seems to be more consistency and more just tolerance, tighter tolerances. And there's something about those guitars, the new guitars that I like. A lot of players cannot stand new guitars, modernized guitars in any way because of the fact that it doesn't feel uh, the way they used to. So what would I notice? It the answer to your question for me is not that I would notice that the Squires felt cheap and the new modern higher end guitars feel great or vice versa. It's that they just feel different because it doesn't, a Squire made in the eighties is not made the same way a Squire made now is, believe it or not. Um, you know, especially the Squires uh, that were made in Japan, right? Japan, anytime you see anything made in Japan, if you watch, you don't have to go there. You can just go on YouTube and type in uh, Alvarez Uyeri, okay? That's an amazing brand of acoustic guitars. That's an amazing factory video. I highly recommend anybody just exactly do that, Uyeri, um, and uh, from Alvarez, and watch that factory video. And that is a really good, in my way, uh, in my opinion, a really good synopsis of what a lot of Japanese factories look like. A lot of hand hands-on, a lot of hand sculpting with the neck, um, a lot of basically luthery, luthery work. <laughs> you know what I mean? It's craftsmen, you know, uh, doing the stuff. Less, less CNCs. Even in today's market, still less, it seems to be less of this CNC reliance and more of the hands-on reliance uh, still in the Japanese guitars. But of course, like in, in, in every company, they're, they're getting there. If they're not there, they're pretty close to all CNC so that's the thing I would notice is that the the an eighty squire to me would feel believe it or not more handmade, uh, and uh, but 
That's the thing I would notice right away. And I notice it all the time when I pick up guitars from uh, pre, I want to say pre heavy CNC times to, to now CNC times. You can kind of tell there's a difference. Um, you start noticing um, bigger gaps when you look in the pickup cavities, bigger gaps on the bridges. Like, like I said, looser tolerances. But in those looser tolerances, there's also this more human feel. That's why I said it's hard to explain it. Uh, it's it's uh, I could understand why somebody's uh, drawn to the fact that somebody's human hands were on the instrument when it's being made more. I understand that. I don't. That doesn't appeal to me. <laughs> I, I wish it did, because I, I, I think there's charm in that. But for some reason, I yeah, the the guitar, uh, you know, somebody would call it sterile when a guitar is manufactured to tight tolerance. I actually find it, you know, calming <laughs> to know that the guitar is like, the more perfect the guitar gets, the more cool it is to me, um, as a whole, as a whole. Okay. So again, um, there you go. So unique insight too. That's the sign on. It says a uh, question. Have you tried the Charvel Guthrie Govan? I have. I wonder how the recessed tremolo works without a locking nut. The price tag is insane though. Um, yeah, they have a, a new affordable one, right? The import made in Mexico Guthrie Govan. I have not tried that. I've only tried the super expensive one. Uh, what is my impression of it? It felt exactly like a sir, which I think is what they were going for. So very high end, very, again, fit and finish, perfect fit and finish, perfect fret work. You know what I mean? Uh, SIRs are like CNC'd perfection with hand perfection cute quality assurance. Kind of that's what they're going for. Every SIR is going to feel like a perfectly finished instrument, in my opinion. And uh, uh, and I didn't find any issues with the uh, the tremolo with the locking, without the locking nut. So what he's talking about is I believe that guitar comes with the Floyd Rose Vintage Bridge. And believe it or not, I have wanted a guitar with a Floyd Rose Vintage Bridge, and the Vintage being not old Floyd Rose unit, the Floyd Rose Vintage Bridge is a Floyd Rose without the individual adjusters on the bridge, and it doesn't have a locking nut. I saw Pete Thorne play one on one of his Sirs, and I've been mesmerized it, mesmerized by it since, and so much so that a uh, very high-end uh, guitar company that you don't know the name <laughs> reached out to me, uh, and we've been talking for about a year now about doing a review of a one of their guitars, and it's one of those cool videos where I get to spec out the guitar, and then we get to see you know what they can do with it, and um, I don't know when that could come out. It could come out literally September this year. You know what I mean? It's just forever, but that's one of the things I asked to, to do because it was an option they offered, and I, I picked a lot of options on this guitar that I'd never really had done. I've never played a Floyd Rose Vintage Bridge. The idea of it sounds amazing to me. I love Floyd Roses the way they feel. I just don't always need to lock them down. So, um, to, uh, to, so at the heart of your question, let me go back to it, um, is that, uh, how does it, how is, how does the recess trimmer work with a locking nut? I, I don't think you need a locking nut. A locking nut is a great device. And I obviously like Floyd's, uh, with locking nuts. I got the Eddie Van Halen right there and I have floating, uh, floating Floyd's. In fact, the, uh, my Ibanez RG seven string RG seven, six twenty has, you know, the, the Ibanez version of it, but essentially a floating bridge. To me, the locking nut is about dive bombs and being really crazy and just, you know, but I'm not tremolo crazy. I don't do tremolo tricks. Um, I haven't done a, a whammy trick since after Passion Warfare came out. <laughs> once once I heard Van Halen and Dimebag Daryl and then Steve I do the whammy tricks, I was like, oh, that's the greatest thing ever. And I try to mimic that, you know, and then I started listening to players like Gary Hoey and Joe Satrani, which I, ironically, Joe does actually play a Floyd style bridge or, you know, an Ibanez uh, locking trim. But there was a lot of players I started listening to that had non-locking trims that I, I thought used a lot of vibrato on the bridge. And um, I just started noticing the same thing. Like, I don't need this. You know what I mean? I don't need to lock everything down. I'm not that crazy with it. I can keep my guitar in tune. Um, and uh, started paying attention to how far, you know what I mean, how, what the pitch is going to be. So locking tremolos are cool. They're not necessary for me, for my style playing. And to be honest with you, I'm, I'm a, yeah, <laughs> let's, I'm going to date myself right now. Does you, does anyone here watching remember what it was like when, uh, you would go to, uh, you would, you would be out in the market to be in a band, right? You're a guitar player. And they'd be like, oh, you're a guitar player. And you're like, yeah. And they're like, we need a guitar player. And you go, oh, I just do rhythm. <laughs> Hopefully right now, some of you guys are relating to this story. I remember a time in my life, I want to say probably for me, it was the early nineties, uh, where it was 
it was important to classify what kind of guitar player you were real quick because because if somebody says, Oh, we're looking for a guitar player, and the bands would say that. Remember the remember the remember the take one phone number thing in the music stores? And it would say, Band looking for lead guitar player must have chops and look. <laughs> and then and then <laughs> And then, and then it'd be like, then you, you're, you're like, oh yeah, I'm not the lead player. So I used to, believe it or not, for a long time when I was a guitar player, you know, early on before I switched to bass, I would tell people like, oh, I'm a rhythm guitar player. That's just something I would tell. Like I would tell a girl that she's like, you play guitar. I'm like, yeah, I'm a rhythm guitar player. And they'd look at you like, what, what are you, why are you saying it that way? Because it was very important that you did not give the impression that you were a lead player. Cause that means you had to have the chops. You were there. Right. Um, so I was never a lead player. The most lead playing I've ever played in my life is on these YouTube videos. And it's just because I'm like, I'm trying to, I don't know, maybe emphasize what the guitar can do. But to be honest with you, outside of a YouTube review video, I don't, I probably don't play any solo work at all ever. Um, I'm the guy that you call and I'll hold down whatever chord structure or whatever song part, you know, that you want. Like I said, I've jammed many times, even on YouTube videos with other YouTube musicians and other other musicians like Phil X and, and, and Larry Mitchell and stuff and all kinds of places, just playing bass, playing guitar. And it's always the same thing. I'm a good rhythm player. I, 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 I can, I can keep in time and do my thing like I'm supposed to. But, uh, when they, when they go Phil McKnight solo on the guitar, it's always like, yeah, that'd been cool if I did that. <laughs> just kidding. That's when I told you in the past, that's when you get out the wah pedal <laughs> and you Kirk Hammett that. It works for Kirk Hammett. It works for anybody. Um, David says, since we're on the subject, we got to hit the subject because I knew it was going to come up. David said mid to late 90s. That was the opposite. It wasn't even late 90s. No, it was mid. L literally 92, 93. That's when grunge starts to like kill in the lead guitar guys. You know what I mean? Um, by far, but yes. So, so I mean, obviously, think of this: from like probably late seventies to early early nineties, that whole time frame, you had to be like, I'm a lead guitar player, I'm a rhythm. <laughs> you know what I mean? Um, it, it's kind of funny. I remember. Do you remember? Uh, and then again, before, we, so we don't get too hammered on the I remember stage of this uh, show. Do you remember like a band, you know, four piece bands, and they're like, we just need a lead guitar player, and we're set. <laughs> We're going to play out next week. I remember a friend's band who had uh, four players, guitar, bass, drums, and singer, and they turned down a gig because they still hadn't found a lead player. <laughs> they had no solos. Can't play in front of people if you don't have a guy who can bring the solos. So, yeah, it's funny that uh, then. Uh, <laughs> and then Drool Fuel says, thank God for grunge. Yeah, I said it. You know, don't, don't feel bad. Everyone's going to have uh, a lot of opinions. What I love now is, is hindsight. We have hindsight. Even the eighties rock stars. I've so I watched so many documentaries now, read so many books. They all agree. Grunge was good for the music and genre. It, it, it ended up, it felt like at the time it was killing the thing we loved, but it really, it was taking the thing that we loved that was getting so out of touch with reality. <laughs> you know what I mean? Uh, that it really kind of centered it back. And I think in the long term, it, 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 it cemented it because I think if something didn't kill hair metal, I think hair metal would have killed metal eventually. That's a, just a thought. Again, I said it, as they say, so I'm sure I'll have to take the hate for it, but that's okay. Um, the uh, uh, And then we'll end on this, and then I'll go to the next subject. Uh, so, so no, I rem what I remember about grunge for me, and I don't consider Alice in Chains grunge, but I, this story, unfortunately, is, is Alice in Chains. And that's my re realization that grunge had happened. I was in Towers Records and Tapes, <laughs> and every Friday I took all the money my mom had gave me for lunch that week in high school and I would take the money and I wouldn't eat lunch. I would, uh, I would always buy a pop, right? You could buy a pop for lunch, you know, go to the soda machine. I bud buy a soda. I wouldn't buy lunch. I'd take all the money I saved all week for lunch and I would go buy a tape and uh, CDs were too expensive. CDs were out, but CDs were like 15 bucks. That was just ridiculous. You could get a tape for seven ninety nine, eight ninety nine, And I'd go to Towers Record and Tapes and I would buy a different tape. And I'd bought the previous week, Tony McAlpine, and I thought it was just amazing. And so the following week I went, I found Y&T because I was always looking for something to listen to. And so I get this cassette, Y&T. I go up to the counter, I'll never forget this. And I put it on the counter and the and the person behind the counter is going to ring me up and I hear chomp, chomp. Womp, chick, womp, chick, womp, womp. And remember, in the old record stores, like I said, since we're doing the I Remember segment of the show now, um, they always took the, the record, cassette, 
or CD that they were playing in the in the in the sound system in the store, they put on the counter facing at you and it says now currently played. And I look over and I see, you know, the Alice in Chains album and I go, what is that? And they go, that's Alice in Chains. And I go, yeah. And I took the Y and T back. I slid it in the little slot and I got Alice in Chains and I went home and I thought, this is the coolest thing I've ever heard in my life. So there you go. Yeah. And Zachary saying Alice in Chains aren't grunge and neither is Soundgarden. I agree. I agree. I don't want to get, you know, but, but like I said, to me, just to be very clear, Alice in Change was obviously amazing, but, and I agree, they're not grunge, but they were the thing that let me realize grunge was happening, that the change was happening because to me, they were a much different vibed thing than I was obviously then, you know, I was, you know, Steve, I, Tony McAlpine, you know, the stuff I was listening to at the time it was different. Um, all right. <laughs> Let's go. Next question. I'm going to uh, grab some of the uh, the pinned early questions. Let's see what I got. Um, okay. And here is the question. Hold on. Clicking around here. Question is, let's go to this. Let's do it this way. We'll do the big screen. Look at that. All right. It says, uh, Brandon Howe said, hey, Phil, why did I stop? He means me. Why did you stop selling your own brand of Asian produced guitars? Uh, any reason why I shouldn't do that with my own designs? Any factories you recommend or that I should avoid? Yeah, I have uh, very easy for me to explain. So I, I never really made guitars. I want to be very clear about that. I've, um, I have made it in, in guitars. I have made two guitars ever uh, uh, for, for, for my brand right back in the day. And this is, again, this is early, early 2000s, 2000, actually, 2001, 2000. Um, I made basses. I was a bass player who making basses. And, and, uh, I've said this before. We talked about my, the guitar, there's a short scale guitar that you can find. Cause there was about 16 of them made about, I think 12 to 16. I can't remember the number, but it was because that's what I had to do to do a production run of that guitar for my daughter from when she was being born. And that's why it's a small scale, uh, LP shaped, odd shaped guitar. I designed it and said, okay, let's make this guitar. And, um, and, uh, designed the pickups, the whole nine yards. And so obviously I gave some away to friends and family. And then we sold off a couple cause we had some overstock obviously. Cause I only need one. My son, I made him a guitar, but I actually made them that guitar, that short scale guitar. That guitar is currently being used by a, a family, a friend of the, a, fa a friend of our family of us. Uh, they gave it to their kid. Um, and it was a short scale as well. So I made my son one and I made my daughter one. Other than that, I've never made guitars, all basses. And, uh, so I was making the basses, uh, high end basses. And then I made an import version of that bass, uh, which they're hard to find, but when you find them, uh, I, I actually like to buy one again, but you never find them. Okay. They're called Zula basses. They're very unique. Uh, they, we were going to call it the Gumby bass, believe it or not. And when you see it, you'll go, yep. And it was going to be green, but believe it or not, we couldn't get licensing permission from for Gumby. <laughs> so we couldn't call it the Gumby base. Um, so we call it the Zula base. Um, and, um, so anyway, so back to that. So I made bases and I did produce, I produce bases. So what I, I told, I've told the story before. I don't want to kill everybody with the same boring stories, but, uh, this is important part of the story. The reason why the question is why I stopped. Yeah. It's because even back then you realize real fast, you can have anybody make you anything overseas, but they're not going to give a crap. Uh, I, I sold, uh, about four or 500 of those bases. That's how many I've sold, uh, back then, which is a lot. I didn't realize back then how many it was. It was actually a really good amount. You know, at the time it felt like we were going to sell a million and then you had no idea. And then when you sell 400, you realize that's a lot of bases to sell. We were really killing it. How I became a, a repair guy is because of that base, because the, the, the container would show up with these bases and we'd go through them and, you know, half of them were unplayable fret in, sprout, bad frets, dead frets, electronic issues, uh, blemishes in the finish, you know, and you know, they knew it. The companies are not dumb. Don't think these companies overseas, um, you know, care, <laughs> you know, they, the, the, the Epiphone, the Fender, that's really not fair. Cause I think those guys pretty much use their own factories now, but you don't understand what I'm saying. The, 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 the brand name guys who are actually producing product in those factories, they put, do big orders, returning orders. One thing I think everybody does is a failure in business when they start a business is this assumption that people want to help you succeed. You know what I mean? You rent a space for your business. You think the landlord, why would he screw me? Cause I'll go out of business and he'll get screwed. No, he doesn't care if you go out of business. He's got you on, you know, just like any kind of loan. They got you, right? Um, the credit card company for processing, they screw you on the interest rates, right? Uh, for, you know what I mean? Everyone takes a jab at you because they realize you're new, 
you're you're you have no idea what you're doing you'll sign anything you have delusions most time when you're in business you get so excited about growth or just even you know being in business that you don't make business decisions you make ego decisions <laughs> right um and so people take advantage of that and uh, so that's usually my first advice when starting any kind of business is be aware that everyone is going once they see you're new that means you're you're fresh meat you know think of it like a prison you know you, you know go to the you see a movie of prisoners and it's fresh meat right the, the new person that's the person that's you know got the most to lose you know the most uh the most they're going to come after so so that's what happened to bases. The uh, and I used uh, different factories. I used uh, a factory in Kaohsiung, right? I was a factory, uh, all Chinese factories at the time, because that's pretty much where you could get it done at that level. Um, and um, that's what I learned. So I learned. Uh, I made good money, and, and in fact, that money was what pretty much bankrolled the store. That's how I opened the store, and uh, we did well. But I did well because I literally kept a full time job in corporate America, working literally 7 a.m. till 6 p.m. every day minimum. And then I would go, come home, have dinner with the kids, tell my wife I love her, and then I'd go out in the garage and I would work on guitars until two in the morning, or basses, I should say, to get them ready for sale. And my wife would sell them and we would just sell them through our website at the time. Yeah. And sometimes eBay, but mostly our website. So um, what I, and so the qu your question, the second part of your question is that's how I did it. The question is, um, oh, and by the way, it might be different now, but back then it was all, you had to bankroll that. You had to pay them up front. So you would pay them and you have to wire transfer it. And then you have to hire a uh, customs broker to get it into the country. You know, you know what I mean? They, it's not like you order it from the factory and then it just shows up. <laughs> You know what I mean? You have to hire, you have to hire, have hire this stuff. It's a, it's a process. This is then, it might be an easy process now. I, I wouldn't care. Like I said, I'd never do it again. Not because I didn't make money, but because I realized that it's, it's a hard game to be the small fish in the big pond. It was so much easier to be the, you know, bigger fish or a medium fish in the medium pond. You know what I mean? I didn't want to feel like at any moment's notice, you know what I mean? They don't care. So it says, any factories you recommend to avoid? Um, no. Uh, you know, I, I don't know what to tell you. I wish I had advice. This is sometimes people have questions for this. I don't want to, again, just say don't do it. That's not where I'm going with this. What I'm saying is I would definitely spend a lot of time informing yourself, educating yourself about it, learning about the process, finding the right people. There are people in this industry who do this for you. You can find them to do this for you. Um, so there you go. And... Uh, and there, there's my answer for whatever unexciting answer that is. Okay, next question. That was a good question, by the way. Thank you uh, for that, for the question. Uh, next question comes from Greg. Greg says, hey, Phil, do how do PRS signatures compare, signature compare with the Dario? So he's talking about the strings. Have a 594 McCarty and generally like the to support Paul Reed Smith, PRS. Um, PRS sent me their strings. I talked about them once. They were good strings. I don't know who makes their strings. Obviously, I've been to the PRS factory many times, uh, like I've been to the you know the Gibson factory before, and I've been to the Fender factory before, and uh, uh, PRS isn't making their strings. So I don't know who makes their strings. I never asked them, um, but they're obviously made by somebody and probably to their specifications uh, for that reason. I, I generally, like I said, a boring answer, and I apologize for the answer, but it's just the answer I got. I use Didario's and I use Stringjoy um, because I like those companies and I, I'm happy with the quality of the strings and that's what I use and um, that's why I use them. Um, I, I have no problem with anyone who says, oh, I use whatever I find on sale. Good. <laughs> Works too. Uh, you know, some strings are different. Most strings are not. I think the, sign I think the PRS signatures, I wouldn't be shocked if to find out they were made by Didario as well. So, because they're on the East Coast, they're right there, and of course, Didario does uh, a lot of, of of OEM. In other words, they you know they're a, they're a commercial kitchen. Didario will make a, lo a lot of strings for a lot of manufacturers. Obviously, they make Fenders. So there you go. I have no idea who makes Gibsons, um, but I saw Vin the Gibsons new vintage string, and um, it was an interesting read. If you haven't checked it out, it was kind of funny. I've never seen, I, I got to give them credit for always having a weird marketing spin on it. But so, you know, when I say them, Paul Reed Smith's got weird marketing stuff too. And I guess Fender does too. It's part of the, part of the benefit of being the big three, so to speak. Okay. Where am I at? <laughs> Lost track. We're at Jam Man. 
Jam Man says, my open B string buzzes since installing a new nut. Okay, now I'm assuming, I because I, you didn't say bass or guitar, so I'm assuming it's a seven string guitar, it's a bass. Um, obviously, it's buzzing a new nut. Well, we know that the, I would assume, Occam's razor, right? You replace the nut, now you have a problem. It's the nut. Um, there's two things you can do. Obviously, you put the old nut back and see if it goes away and that isolates it to the nut. Or what I like to do, if it's buzzing, what I would say is take a piece of paper, literally just a piece of paper, um, fold it, you know, to double thickness of a piece of paper. Don't worry about how, how it looks. Lift the B string, loosen the B string up, lift it up, stick it in the slot, put the B string in, tighten it down, and then tear off the excess piece of paper and then play it. And if the problem goes away, you know that the nut slot is cut a little too deep. That's what it sounds like to me. It's cut a little too deep. That's an easy way to do it. If you don't have any gap gauges or anything else to check, that's how I would do that. Super easy. Um, Litve, hey, what's up? Says, uh, I could not I could not do one of these for weeks because a tech bug. Okay, is that like a virus on your computer? I'm not a tech person. Three weeks ago, uh, you missed my Ibanez RG565 reissue question. Okay, original prices go up or down? Okay, so what he's uh, talking about is obviously Ibanez has reissued the RG565 uh, in that neon orange and then that green, the cool green color. And so his question is, do the prices go up or down from that? My guess is they uh, don't go up now, okay? They go up later. That's what I keep seeing with all these guitars, uh, these reissues Ibanez. At first, as long as Ibanez makes it, the prices stay down because you can buy a brand new RG565 for a thousand bucks street, which means literally no deals, no phone calls, no hook, you know, hook me up, nothing. So a thousand bucks. So whatever they were before, they're not going to get a thousand dollars used for them because most of the time you can get one, you know, it holds the price at bay. We saw that with the RG five fifties, the, the re, they come out reissue as long as they made them, it holds down the prices. Um, but for example, when Ibanez did the RG five uh, seventies, seven seventies, sorry, RG seven seventies limited run in the, in the red and the blue back in 2008 ish. I don't know when that was 2000, maybe it was 2012. Somewhere around that time they, they made them. Those were also like 1200 bucks. You saw the prices of the other ones holding down. And then as soon as those were discontinued, then those started going for 12 to 15 used and now pushing the originals up. So to answer your question, I think at first, as long as they're making them, the prices go down. But once they stop, the used prices will shoot up. That's just my guess based on what they've done in the past. David's got a question that says, what do I think of the Fred guitars? Fred with P-H-R-E-D. Fred guitars selling a much more affordable and gettable. I like that word, gettable <laughs> version of uh, Paul Languidox, uh, Trey and, Trey and, St oh, Anast I can't say his name. I know it. Trey Ana Anastasia, Stasio. I apologize to all the fish fans. Okay. I'm sorry. <laughs> Sometimes you just get tongue twied, tied, twied. You get tongue twied. Anyways, Trey Anastasio. I think that's right. Anastasio, uh, guitar. So if you guys don't know, uh, Basically, uh, uh, there's a guitar called a Languidoc. It's very expensive. It's like $10,000 and the replicas are pretty pricey and it's a thing. Okay. So it's definitely a small thing. Okay. What I mean by that is there's not a lot of players into it, but the ones that are into it are super into it. That's why if you notice, I'm just being very cautious how I say this, cause I don't want to offend them. They really are into this. And so being a novice, not knowing a lot about the Languidoc guitars, other than knowing that it's this recreation, you know, like I said, there's a ton of companies that make these great Languidoc guitars. Um, <laughs> Flippity Doo says they're too stoned to get mad. Yeah. Yeah. Why, why would they get mad? Yeah. They should be chill, right? They should be like, you're good, brother. Keep going. So anyways, uh, so the question is, uh, his question, which is interesting because I, he's saying, um, so basically what he's saying, this is important. Fred Guitars, PH, uh, is selling a much more affordable guitar. He says, uh, sort of like a Harley Benton, but a copy uh, of a big company. So what he's saying is it's more affordable. Usually an affordable, when you guys hear, here's the thing. I've worked on a couple of of, of Languidoc copies, Languidoc copies, uh, guitars over the years. Uh, and uh, cause they come into shops because people buy these for, you know, 1500, 2500, $3,500 is this copy of a guitar. 
right? So imagine 2,500 bucks and you pay, you bought a copy of a guitar and they usually have problems with them. You know what I mean? Cause they're, there's all these, you know, I don't want to say hacks, but let's just say, cause that's really, really rude. I would never, and it's not even accurate. Um, it's just, you know, somebody taking a stab at it. Somebody starting making them right. And they probably have some good luthery skills, but they're not there yet. You know, to me, but they get this top dollar mark because you know, you can't afford the real ones. Um, and so I've done a lot of stuff where I had to fix intonation on them and all kinds of weird stuff. And that's how I even know about them. You know, I can imagine the first time I probably saw one was back in 2000. I don't know, maybe four or five. And I was like, what the hell is this? <laughs> I had to learn all about them. And so, um, so it's interesting. So when you, so I say this only to the viewers, I'll put a timestamp as I always do on this and I'll link it to the website for Fred guitars. However, I'm always nervous because you're saying affordable, affordable could mean for that type of guitar, a thousand, fifteen hundred dollars And you say Harley Benton, I'm thinking $300 language duck. Oh, I'd buy one just to have it right now. If there's a $300 language duck out there, it's sold. I just bought it. <laughs> okay. Uh, because I would just do it just because, like I said, I've seen them over the years and they're kind of cool and they're hollow body and there's, you know, and, and all the ones I played are kind of, you know, vibe. But what I also learned is a pitfall for all of you guys out there, a little interesting, uh, also observation of the, the diehard fans of these, they end up always buying two or three copies over the years because, you know, they're always looking for the elusive better one that's close to the original. I think a lingua doc is like the, and I dare say this, it's like not the Dumble. That's not fair. It's not the Dumble of guitars, but it's definitely the clon of guitars. It's this holy grail guitar that you have to buy a copy of. So, so there you go. Grumpy Mike Guitar says, I want a Fred uh, Deadbolt. So, okay, I'll check them out. Like I said, I'll be checking them out tonight too. And if they're that good, I'm sure there'll be none left because you guys will scoop them while I'm talking on the show. <laughs> If anyone really likes me and they're really legit, like 300 bucks, buy me one and I'll pay you back. No, wait, don't do that because the 10 of you guys will buy me one and I'll have 10 of these things. Uh, no, okay, I'll just, hopefully you guys don't buy them out of that. Or hopefully, like I said, it's it's uh, it's probably what I think it is. It's probably $1,000, $1,500, which is still affordable, but not, not you know, hardly bent prices. Um, okay. Um, Okay, so Dead Shred Nine says question. Uh, Hi Phil, it says I've never owned a true tube amp. I use a Blackstar ID Core 10 watt and a Boss Katana Mark a two. It's a 50 watt Mark II, and I am happy with both. But I'm, but am I really missing something? Sure, I, I I love this question because this is I think the heart of what maybe a a, a live QA show can do every week, and I hope this is this is. If anything ever happens from this show, that's good. It's always this question. You watch a thousand YouTube videos and everybody's going to be like, man, what you need is this Gibson Les Paul through that Marshall or Fender amp. And I, of course, there's, look, it's iconic. It sounds amazing. I'm going to tell you a true story, a real story that literally just happened yesterday because it's going to hit this home. Yesterday, I was playing my, <laughs> my Line 6 H9 into my PreSonus interface into my Personas studio monitors with my Ibanez Indonesian AZ for literally, well, yeah, literally two, three hours. I was, I was, I didn't want to work because I was going to the doctors and I had two hours. I was done, you know, I was ready too early. So I was sitting around. So I just started playing guitar for two hours. I literally could have been floating on in clouds in heaven, how much joy I had. And never once did it occur to me like, man, I need to unplug from this crap plug that real guitar into that real amp over there um no there's something cool about a tube amp there's just something magical about how it works in in the idea of live music and in sometimes when you're in that moment but no i don't think i would ever miss it never i don't think i would ever miss a tube amp or a quote unquote you know boutique type guitar I think I've worked hard and I've collected a long time and I'm kind of happy to have these. But like I said, eventually one day, I don't know, have to sell everything to pay some stupid bill. That's how life goes. I've, hopefully not, but happens. And if that does, I'll do exactly that. And I'll keep, you know, probably my, my champ, or not my champ, my Princeton, probably keep a Princeton and a good overdrive pedal and Nathan's guitar he made me. That's right. There, I'm pointing at Nathan's guitar with the new wide cam. Wide cam! <laughs> I didn't need any close-ups down. I have two camera angles and anyways. Uh, so um, there you go. You're not missing nothing. And uh, I honestly, I'm telling you that from the heart. 
If you decide to buy a tube amp, it's just because you want it. You'll never miss it if you don't. And now 15 people will tell you how wrong I am, but that's okay. They have their opinion too, and their opinion is just as valid as mine. So, but that's just my opinion. Uh, and then No Mojo says Phil's going to add himself to the many thousand of millions whom love valves, me included, but cannot tell you why. Absolutely beautifully put. Yeah, we know why. It's historic. There's a mo there's a way it feels. There's, you know, there you go. Um L John. Hey L John, wide cam. Yeah, right? Wide cam. I figured I'd do wide cam since I'm set up a uh, three camera rig now, but I don't need any downward shots for showing you guys anything on the on the countertop. Um but yeah, it's it's like I said. Uh, here's what I would tell you on a side note to that question. There's no reason not to buy a tube amp too, by the way. So, that's what it is. Do you need to buy one? No. But is there a reason not to buy one? No, not really. So, but um, like I said, I have the Helix. I decided over time I like the Helix, uh, or should I say the HX Stomp? That's what I have, which is basically Helix. Um, I don't know what it is about that, that that identified with me better. You know what I mean? That I liked it, I preferred it over the Katana. But for downstairs, for space, for comfort, for needs, I have the Spark. It works great. It's smaller fits on my workshop desk. You guys seen any of the repair videos now you've seen it's in the background of that. Um, and so I use that and then upstairs instead of the Katana, I'm just using the, the HX stomp into my interface. Works great. But you know, just cause I have studio speakers. If I didn't, I'd just go back to a Katana. Okay. Um, <laughs> uh, I'm just going to read it. Drew, Drew Phil, Fuel, Drew, Drew, Tongue Twister, Drew Fuel <laughs> says, you need at least a half stack for clubs. I, I remember that thinking that. I used to do that. Like, I, I'm, I wish I wasn't. I wish I could say I could make fun of the dudes who did that. I want to. <laughs> I remember having two full stacks. I had a Randall and a crate, but it was a tube. It was a stealth crate. So, you know, let's get that crate. It was two amps. Well, I had the Randall was solid state and the crate was tube. I had these two full stacks on stage. I have no idea why. <laughs> to this day, can't explain it. Just, I don't know. Just had to. Had to have stacks because, I don't know. Because that's what you do. All right. <laughs> let's go. Let's go to another question. We have, uh, we have, yeah, it is studios. That's the sign on. Yeah, it is studios. A little something to say thank you for what you do. Uh, have a great, good weekend. Thank you so much. I hope you uh, have a good weekend as well. And, and, and thank you for joining the, the show. BK did a super chat for no reason. Thank you, BK. That was really kind of you again. It's a nice way to support the channel. And here's something I want to bring up too. So I, I very rarely uh, get to see YouTube videos anymore. I, I started YouTube videos. I started putting YouTube videos out because I was watching them like crazy and I oh, make some too, right? And uh, now I don't get to watch them because <laughs> I always feel guilty when I'm watching a YouTube video. Like I should be working on something. You know what I mean? Um, so I was uh, poking around and uh, what came in my feed was the guitologist uh, did a video and it was... Um, it was, uh, I need help. And, uh, you know, I was like, ah, oh, clickbait. <laughs> hey, you know what? We're all guilty of it. You know, whatever you're going to do. I, I watched a real YouTuber, a professional YouTuber say, you know, he's never going to feel guilty for clickbait. He's like, what's what's the other option? No one watches your stuff. So, I, you know, I try to minimize the clickbait, but yeah, I, I dabble in it as much as I possibly can. And that I, and I think I do as, I do as much clickbait as I think I can get away with without you guys getting upset. Um, cause that's how I level it. I don't want to lose anybody in this, in my, in my viewership, but I also don't want to lose out opportunities to get new viewers. And, um, so anyways, he did a clickbait video and I watched it and it wasn't a clickbait video. Um, so basically what the video is about is this, uh, this girl named Squishy who, um, is uh, basically, I want to keep it very basic. Um, I put a link to the squishy.com. Um, you can donate $20. Okay. Just telling you guys, uh, again, I don't want to always be a channel. It's like, Hey, donate, do this stuff. But you know, I feel like I'd rather spend time talking about this than mentioning another pedal that we don't need or something. So I just want to let you know, it was super easy. I didn't do anything extravagant. I just clicked the $20 button. You can buy a, you know, donate 20 bucks. You can buy a shirt for 40 bucks. I kind of regret not buying that. I shouted to that. I told my wife this morning at coffee, I maybe I should have done that, but I did the $20 thing. It doesn't seem like a big uh, thing to check out. I would definitely check out this. There's a video about it. There's other stuff. Um, 
it just, you know, obviously I don't think it, I, I think it speaks to you. And that, that's why I said, I don't want to go into it. We'll keep the momentum of the show. But I felt like if, even if I can get one more viewer looking at that, I'd like to get at least one of you guys looking at it. So there you go. Please uh, check it out. It's, um, it's really, it's worth, it's worth it. It's worth it. Um, you know, if you're fortunate enough that you're doing well right now and you know, maybe it's good. Some it's good karma. I also feel like, Hey, after the pictures from Larry I kind of feel like, you know, if I could spread some, keep that karma moving, you know, it's always nice, especially now. All right. On that note, let's get back to questions. But like I said, please check that out. If you're concerned or if you're considerate, I'd appreciate it. Is what I want to say. Um, Andy's uh, question was, since today seemed to be quad cortex embargo release. Oh, I don't know what that is. What's the quad cortex uh, day? Do you have any plans to review this new wonder device? I don't know what it is. Um, uh, as I've told you many times over, I, I, I'm really not in that uh, circle of you know, I mean, most companies aren't looking at me that way. I was very lucky. Um, I'll, I'll be honest. I told you guys before NAM, everybody's like, oh, what NAM gear, you know, are you getting on the channel? And I literally, I only had PRS, uh, Gene at PRS, who I have a good relationship with, said, hey, would you like to check out the Custom 24 and uh, SE, which I did. That was a loner guitar. It will go back. And um, to be honest with you, and this is just, again, for full transparency, you guys bought so many of those freaking things. They sent out the Zach Myers. Cause they're not dumb. Who's, you know, right. They're not dumb. You guys did that. That's why you guys rock. Remember, they don't care about me. They care about you. They, that was impressive. They liked the video. Jean, Jean, of course, you know, she, she, she's just nice to me, period. But so they sent out the Zach Meyer. So I did the Zach Meyer. So that's what I did. Um, other than that, you know, I don't see a whole lot of stuff, not really as a whole. So, um, uh, on that, and I have no objections to it. I just, I, I don't think I, I don't think they look at me that way as a, as that kind of review channel, even though I technically think I am. <laughs> so there you go on that note. There you go. Uh, so on the quad core text thing, I have no idea what it is. I could Google it right now, Andy, but I'll probably check it out tonight. Uh, if it's something cool, I'll probably end up buying it anyways. <laughs> or, uh, what I find is, and I've said this before and I have no problem with this, especially since I know sometimes companies watch these live shows cause it has a pretty good reach, especially in the podcast platform. Um, I find where I really feel uh, kind of hit my stride and companies work with me the most is at the end of every one of these kind of things, right? So you get the really good demo channels to demo it because obviously they're going to show you how great it is, which is important because you need to know if you even want the thing. And then, you know, and then some of the review channels, and then I always tend to get it at the end of a <laughs> tail end of a cycle, right? Um, uh, it's very, I see it all the time. Like if I see like Daryl Braun get a product, then I, it's not really shocking to me when I hear the company reach out to me two months later. <laughs> you know what I mean? Uh, so, so there you go. So on that note, Andy, if they, you know, reach out to me later, I'll probably check it out. Or if it's cool, I'll reach out to them. Um, but I've said this before with you guys, if it's something that you guys think like, man, I'd really like to see Phil check it out, just reach out to them and let them know. A lot of times they, you know, they'll do it just because you guys seem interested. So, uh, David says opinion on the amp sims on the spark. Okay. So I know there's new amp simulations on the spark. And if you watch my review, I prided myself on not really using the app or any of the, inter you know, any interface stuff on the spark. And I love my spark. I still use it all the time. I'd say every day, but you know, may at least five times a week I'm playing through the spark. I love the spark. I highly recommend the spark, especially, um, if they're in stock, I hear they're back out of stock again. So if you get one now, you're back on that delay thing again. That's what I heard. But I have not done anything to it. So I need to. Maybe I should check some stuff out. But I've been really happy. Um, um, uh, because, like I said, it's a great amp. It's a great amp. I was really curious with the new Blackstar ID Core, which I really enjoyed. For the price point of that amp, for 149 I thought it was a really good amp, but it wasn't is the Spark. I thought it was going to be their kind of attack on the Spark, and uh, it's good. It's not there, but it doesn't have the price point of the Spark either. Okay. Um, where are we at? Let's see. There's like 1,300 of us. I can always tell when there's a lot, uh, when it crosses 1,000, because the starts scrolling a little faster for my eyes to catch stuff. Um Smelly Cat's Jazz. Hey, Smelly Cat. Smelly Cat's Jazz says, how does the texture of the Rosewood Fender American Pro compare to the Axion label? Is it similar unfinished feel? If not, 
can it be sanded to, to match? So uh, I feel, uh, so I have two. So I have the American Pro Fender um, uh, Rosewood Neck and I have an American Standard Rosewood Neck Strat. I have both. They both feel, feel very consistent. Um, they, and I played the Axion label guitars. I, they feel smoother to me than the Axion label does. Uh, probably because of the, the way it just feels, the pores are tighter. So that would be my, my take on that. Um, and if I wanted to smooth it out, I would probably use just steel wool. I like to steel wool everything on the neck. I just like the way it feels and it works for me. There's other techniques too, but that's what I use and it works great. So, um, so to answer your question, uh, smoother than the Axion, what I remember of both, you know, I mean, I've played both. Um, but I would also, if you need it smoother, you steel wool it. Um, Enrico says, how should radius saddles for compound radius board, uh, to the closest radius to the bridge? Okay. So this is a question that keeps coming up and it's a nightmare of a question, uh, especially on a forum, you know, on a, on a video forum where it's all verbal. So essentially Enrico, there's so many ways to do it. So I'll just tell you how I do it. And then, but I mean, I've read like you, which is probably, I think that's why everybody gets confused. There's so much, I don't want to say math. But there's so much logic to what you have to do to compound radius. So uh, a lot of people will say, a lot of people, so actually take a step back. Let me hit you with uh, with where this question is probably coming from. So if you guys don't know, there's a lot of compound radius guitars out there. This is something that just, I don't know, 15 years ago wasn't even really a thing. I mean, you saw Jackson with them and maybe a couple of, but then of course, Fender started getting crazy with it. Companies started getting crazy with it everywhere and you start seeing it more and more. And, uh, and of course, other brands as well. But um and, and they go from 10 inch to 14 inch to 12 inch to 16 inch. I've seen them nine and a half to 14, all kinds of variations. Essentially what most uh, guitar companies will tell you is, is that when you set the bridge radius to the neck, you want to continue the expansion. So in other words, if it starts at 10 and, it, and on, the, on the first fret and on the 22nd or 24th fret at 16, you want to set the bridge to like 20, right? Because it's just going to continue to get flatter as it goes. I don't do that. Um, I, I, for a lot of times I'll do it by feel. Uh, in other words, just adjust the saddles and then kind of, you know, just side it, play it. I mean, always play everything. Measurements get you close. Feel gets you the rest of the way. That's just my opinion, but it, it served me well. And, um, you know, it serves my, my, my customers well. But uh, that being said, if it's 10 to 16, I'll just raise the bridge at 16. I'll go as flat as, as the flat as the, the bridge will take to that. That's where I look at. And the reason I, I do it that way is I understand their logic. Their logic is, is that if it's, uh, let's say 10 to 16, the nut is radius at about 10 and therefore the bridge uh, needs to be radius at where it ends up. And you have to pretend that the fretboard keeps going past the 24th fret all the way to the bridge. And of course, if it's 16 on the 24th fret, it can eventually get flatter and flatter and it's, it ends up around, around 20. And that's so layman's to explain it that way, that sometimes you can upset some of the, the really high end master build guitars because they're like, that's not it. Let me explain the math. And you're like, geez, all I just want to do is adjust my bridge. So, um, I just use that rule. It works great for me. No one's ever complained. I don't complain on my guitars that way. Uh, I don't have any complaints with my guitar set up that way. So that's the rule I find, uh, works for me. So if that helps. And I always think maybe a couple of videos, maybe about a year ago, I think I said it backwards. So if I said it backwards in the past, or if I said opposite in this past, this is the right way. Sometimes I'll get a little, I've, I've, uh, I've improved my train of thought on these live shows, but you can understand as the live shows have grown, I've become more tenured. When I went from a hundred people to 500 people to a thousand people live and watching the scrolling, it got a little overwhelming. <laughs> now I don't feel so overwhelmed. I feel like I can keep track of at least what I'm trying to keep track of. I know I missed like 90% of your comments. Um, that's why sometimes I like to rewatch the show, even though I don't want to watch myself. I want to read your comments, but, and I, but at least I get a, a sense of it. Um, okay. Let's go to the next. Okay. Stunt. Okay. Cause I like to hit, try to hit questions that are on the subject we're on. Stunt guitarist says, Hey Phil, why does seven and a half inch radius fretboards get so much hate? It's not that hard to bend on that radius. Is it? Um, yes. <laughs> no, I'm just kidding, man. Um, no, it gets hate because it's not a great design. Let's, 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 let's just call it where it's at. 
we understand Leo's thought process, right? Leo, Leo Fender essentially, when he was doing seven and a half, he was like cowboy chords. <laughs> you know what I mean? Um, and it's not a bad design. I have a seven, my, my, my silver sky is seven and a half and I've learned to deal with it. And like a lot of guitar players, I whine about it. And, 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 and what I've learned is, and this is why I tell you the stunt guitarists. And again, just setting up guitars with customers and dealing with guitar players and how they like things and just learning people. What I've learned is, is if you like seven and a quarter or seven and a half, you love it. So again, I'll repeat that. If you like seven and a half, you love it. There is no like, yeah, I can deal with it. It's okay. It's, I love it. Why isn't everything this way? Um, and, and, and essentially that falls in all kinds of categories. You know, it's like, why do, why do people complain about stick shifts, right? I have a friend who won't drive a car if it's not a stick shift. He doesn't, he doesn't like the car unless he can shift the, the, the gears. I literally could care less. <laughs> so, so again, it doesn't make what he thinks or I think wrong or right. It's just, a, it's a, not only an opinion, but it's a preference. I don't like, um, like I said, I'm a Goldilocks about everything. I like the guitars about medium weight, <laughs> like the, the fretboard. I like, I like the whole Paul Reed Smith 10 thing, 10 to 12. I like that. That's really nice for me. Um, 10 to 12. So Gibson to Paul Reed Smith. I like that. Nine and a half. I can tolerate. I like it fine. 16 on Ibanez. I like that fine. But it, when I make a guitar or have a guitar built for me, it's always 10 to 12 is where I go. And again, 20 inch, like a classic guitar, some of the shredder guitars, you know, not really loving that. Don't love seven and a half, but I play them all and I'm happy with them. But like I said, what I've learned is uh, I would imagine stunt guitars, you love seven and a half and that makes you rare. And you know, it's great. That makes you, it makes you unique and cool. Cause then you're standing in a crowd of fewer people that like something that's really unique. But a lot of players complain about it because it is different and it's, it's not, it's not hard to play. It's not harder to play, but I will tell you this. Uh, it's also another problem is, is that with seven and a half and, and, and on a tie rate here, one of the problems with seven and a half inch radius working on guitars is when it's not right, it's a mess. It's a disaster. It's like freaking, I want to curse because it's so, so bad. Um, when, when a fretboard is not right, the rounder it is, the more you have, the more every problem is exaggerated. So you know what I mean? So in other words, if the frets aren't perfectly level, if the neck's not, you know, if it's not set to the right um, relief, if everything's not right, a seven and a half inch will show every problem just like that. And so, and, and also on that same note, when a seven and a half inch radius guitar is perfect, like it just the stars align and everything goes right, you go, why wouldn't everybody love this? I think the flatter the fretboard radius, the more you get to hide some of the mistakes of the guitar, the imperfections of the guitar. They let you to be a little bit more forgiving because the lower action, you know, doesn't have to worry about running up on the middle of the center where it's a hump and there's just, so that's another factor too you have to factor in. Uh, let's see. Okay. Go, hold on. I'm, I'm going back to the, to... Okay, Stunt Guitarist. Hey, you did a super chat too. Stunt Guitarist says, how do you feel about Rickenbackers and why do they seem like they don't get love of Gibson's Fenders, et cetera? Well, they're not really, you know, mass produced uh, as an instrument. They're expensive. You know, I mean, Gibson's are expensive, but at least Gibson has Epiphone. You know what I mean? At least there's an affordable line of instruments to give you a taste of it. There's no taste of Rickenbacker, right? You got to come Rickenbacker with a grip of cash. You know what I mean? Um, and they are fantastic instruments. I like Rickenbackers. I had a Rickenbacker guitar. I've never owned a Rickenbacker bass, but obviously if you've seen any of my bass playing uh, on the videos, you'll see my, my style doesn't, doesn't really line up with that instrument. Um, I love that instrument, but I, it doesn't line up with it. The guitar I absolutely love. I just thought the neck was really tiny for my hands. And, you know, it was one of those things. I don't know if I regret getting rid of Rivet because I had a blue one. It was really unique, but I wanted it because, you know, I wanted like this Tom Petty kind of sound and I ended up just getting a telly. <laughs> Um, but no, the great guitars, I don't think that's that they don't get love. They're just, they're, they're, they are, they are by design. Look at the company's philosophy and how they make guitars. It hasn't changed. They, they want to be exactly, in fact, here's how I'll put it. Rickenbacker is right now where they probably want to be. And they probably always wanted to be. They want to be a very niche, high end, you know, right? Very specific clientele. Is exactly what it's supposed to be. They never wanted to be like Leo Fender. The day he started, he wanted to be the McDonald's of guitars. 
You know what I mean? So of course he succeeded. The company has succeeded as everyone who, who wants a fender gets a fender, right? Uh, everyone, you know what I mean? It's universally an instrument that most people can identify with. There's no weird things. Rickenbackers, dual, dual, dual truss rods, weird bridge components. <laughs> you know what I mean? Lacquered fretboards. I mean, it's just its own thing. And that's what's beautiful about it. Um, but I think the reason why, so not only does it have that niche, but also the fact that you have to, to get a Rickenbacker that's affordable, you have to buy a knockoff somebody else. Like Schecter makes a couple, somebody makes, you know, Schecter does too. But like I said, but a lot of companies make knockoffs, but that's why, uh, John, John says, thanks, Phil took a guitar setup class last Saturday. You have inspired me to work my way towards building a kick guitar. Thanks. Kick guitars are cool. Like I said, I sometimes like to just take a guitar and take it apart and just rebuild it, you know, uh, again, because um, I, I know what I'm messing with. See, a kick guitar, and I've learned from you guys to like kick guitars. I did the two Crimson kits. I've still not done a cheap kit. Here's what I don't like about cheap kit guitars. <laughs> okay. There's, there's, and remember, it's a difference of a repair person versus a builder. I'm a repair person. At, you know, that's the majority of my career. I've built a little... I've repaired a lot. As a repair person, it's all about assessing the problem and fixing it. You give me a guitar and I look at the problems and if it have, even if like that Glary I did where I did the video where I took a $75 Glary and turned it into a high-end guitar and it refretted it, new bridge, routed it, did all that stuff. It was like, that's crazy. I'm like, yeah, but see, I knew what everything was wrong with that guitar before I started. A kick guitar is like, okay, I got to put it together and then figure out what the hell they did wrong with it. <laughs> You know, where is the problems? You know what I mean? So kit guitars don't seem as fun to me, like cheap kit guitars. The crimson guitar kits, I almost feel, not almost, I do. I feel guilty because those kits are so, those are so good. They were so good as kits. Um, and uh, and for the record, I, I think it, like anything, you can get good and bad of anybody, but I don't think crimson ever sent me handpicked kits. Uh, that's not what I got the impression from the kits I got, but they were good. Um to me, like if I was going to do a kick guitar, which I was going to do in 2020, but it fell through, would be to Warmoth parts, take Warmoth parts and put a kit guitar together. Um, but, but yeah, so I'm just telling you, if you want to do a kick guitar, that's great. But I still like sometimes maybe just take a Squire and just redo that. It's kind of fun too. Um, okay, so looking at the clock. Time goes by fast for me. Okay, Enrico's got a, a comment. He says, uh, Guitar Center, I think it says GC Hack. So Guitar Center Hack. Guitar Center Hack from a manufacturer rep. To avoid getting gear from a Guitar Center store, call a store and ask them to source from the KCDC store. Employees can pick the source. New CE24 is sealed and got a GC Pro deal. Okay, so I think what he's saying is basically... Um, the hack is that you can, to avoid getting a guitars. So what he's speaking about, I just want to make sure I'm clear. So what I'm getting is he's talking about the fact that we've talked about in the past, ordering new good gear from guitar center and getting store demoed stuff sent to you. What he's saying, the hack to get around that is to call the store and ask the employee to source from KC DC. Okay. Um, so, uh, uh, so it'd be Kilo, Charlie, Delta, Charlie, um, store employees can pick that source. So the employees can pick from that source after you ask them to. And then, so in his case, he got a brand new custom CE24 PRS sealed and got the GC pro deal. He got the deal. Um, so there you go. So there's your answer. So anyone who wants to order from guitar center, but doesn't want that, what we've seen, um, where you got a used piece of gear or a demo piece of gear instead of new, you can ask them to source from the KCDC. So very cool. Thank you, Enrico, for the update. That's really cool to know. Um, All About Guitars said, I just bought an Epiphone Wilshire 66. How can something that ugly plays so well? <laughs> now, here's the question. This is the question, I and this is the downfall of this show, Okay. This show, what I love about it is it's it's an interview show, but I'm interviewing you guys. I'm talking to you guys through your, you know, we're dialoguing through your comments, through me, you know, verbally. Sometimes it sucks because I can't follow up, you know, and, you know, I can't ask you a question back. Here's the question I got, I would love to know all about guitars. Uh, and, and, and is when you say, 
Epiphone Wilshire 66, how can something so ugly play so well? Do you think it's ugly? Like you're like, this is ugly, but I bought it anyways. Or do you think people think it's ugly? Because I find myself just saying that same thing. I'll say like my Parker fly is ugly, but I actually don't think it's ugly. I love it. <laughs> so I've, I have some guitars personally that I've said are ugly like you. I'm like, wow, it's really ugly, but I like it. And really it's not that I think it's ugly. I just know that most players think it's ugly. So I don't think the Wilshire, Wilshire 66 is ugly. Um, I think certain guitars have a charm. And I know that's kind of like a cop-out way to say, you know, it's like, hey, but it's got a great personality. Maybe the Epiphone Wilshire is a guitar with a great personality. It's It does. There's a, there's a charm to that look to me. Uh, I think companies, I think guitars from the 60s, right? And sometimes we'll say early 70s, but because that time frame, 60s, like the Dane Electros and the, and like, you know, the, the Wilshire and stuff. There's some guitars in the 60s to me that just have this, it's like a bubble of time where it has charm. You know what I mean? And uh, I love it. So I actually like it. So there you go. But I understand what you're saying. It's uh, And how could it play so well? They do really good work. Um, I, I, I think I talked about this once before on a podcast. I'll talk about it again. You guys, as you guys know, when you buy uh, Know Your Gear merch, a lot of you send me pictures and I put them in the videos. And please, you know, if you ever if you ever want to send me pictures, please send them to the Ask Know Your Gear at Gmail. Just put in the subject matter picture. And I always make sure I grab them. I always post them. And if I haven't posted them, just send it to me again. It just means that somehow it got lost. It happens sometimes. Um, what it really happens is sometimes I'll go two months and I get one picture. And then sometimes I'll get 10 pictures in one day or, you know, 20 pictures over a week. And it just gets a little confusing sometimes. So, you know, so just hit me again. Um, it's, it's kind of a one man show. So it's a lot, a lot for me to track, but, um, but uh, what's funny is, I think I told you guys, I organized all the pictures one day in folders and I decided to do the folders by the guitar you have. So at the end of shows now, I'm trying to put the pictures of people who actually play the guitars that I just reviewed, the brand. Epiphone was the number one folder. It's the biggest folder. 900 and something, I think it's 916 pictures have Epiphone players with Know Your Gear shirts. By far, no one even came close second. So, you know, not even, not even Fender and Squire pictures combined came to a second cl close. I think the second highest folder after that is like two, 300. For some reason, you guys, it's obviously, it's obvious to see why Epiphone has the market hold it has. Um, what else? We're on Fred. <laughs> okay. Sorry guys. I'm trying to stay focused. Fred says, just want to say hi and thank you for the advice maybe a month ago. Okay. He says, I was looking for a single cut, but more metal than a Les Paul. Aha. Traditional 2012. You told me that to try the LTD. Just wow. The LTD EC 1000, uh, see through purple. That's the color too. You got the color I would pick too. Um, have a good weekend, Phil. I'm glad it worked out. It was good. Like I said, it's, it's great. I, I really like, um, like I said, my favorite Gibson is my Gibson. Hey, wide shot. It's this Gibson right here. <laughs> uh, it's the Gibson uh, Gibson Light that I uh, got from AMS, uh, and it's a thin. It's a it's a it's like an inch thicker or thinner than a regular Les Paul. And what's great about that? By the way, I thought Al John was here earlier. If Al John's here, man, that's the Epiphone you need to make. You make an Epiphone Light, but it's just light body, but it's thicker. You need the thinner one because what I what I hate. What I hate and like about this is I love ESP guy, guitars, okay? So it's not that I hate recommending ESP, ESP, ESP guitars, but I recommend the LTD uh, Eclipse because it's essentially the affordable version of that guitar. So there you go. That's why I recommend that guitar. Plus, I mean, in his case, he wanted metal and it has EMGs and stuff. But but yeah, it's that's what I like about the, uh, the LTD. So this to me, this Gibson Lite is really the Gibson version of an Eclipse. I like the ESP Eclipse, but having a Gibson that's like the Eclipse is really freaking cool too. So there you go. Um, James says, thanks for several years of entertainment. Thank you. Thank you. Oh my goodness. And he did a huge super chat. I appreciate that so much, very much. Thank you. Um, that was really cool. Thank you. And then Buzz Wilson says, speaking of badass bridges, is there a significant difference when running the strings through the body? Um, yes. Now here's why that's different. Running strings through the body on a bass, just like a guitar, isn't so much about adding sustain. It can be, of course, right? Adding, uh, adding, you know, running the strings to the body, all this stuff, you know, that, that's again, the tone chasing aspect. It's great, but there is actually a real difference in the way the string feels. 
Um, this is an argument I have had and successfully won, and I will gladly argue anyone on. Essentially, there is reasons why the, the longer the string is past the saddle, changes the way the guitar feels just does <laughs> the break angle and how extreme it is and how and how and not only how extreme but also uh well how little and how much it is and then how far it is before it goes in the body uh changes things uh so yes to me i actually like the way basses feel the strings feel through the body so everyone is going to notice a different kind of feeling all right um and it's hard. Again, I I'm, I wish I, you know what? I'm going to probably start doing it. I'll probably keep a little dry, dry erase board and I'll start writing and I'll use the wide cam and we'll start doing a dry. I'm going to put a little dry thing here, erase board, so I can illustrate because that I could do it. I could answer your question on the string through body with a dry erase board um, because the, the reason why it changes the way the strings feel, how much, how it feels when you bend. The, the argument is, and so you guys know, so in case anybody starts going on a tangent, because sometimes the argument becomes, well, no, the string tension from the bridge, the point of the bridge to the nut, once you turn it up to pitch, if it's a 10 gauge string, it's the same tension. It is the same tension, but how you pull on that string is changed by how far they go past and how they're connected to the guitar and all that stuff changes in the movement of the string, the way you touch and move the string. So, so yeah, so it does change it. Um, and I tend to like guitars. That's why I like uh, that. So, you know, this is such a big deal. Believe it or not, if you don't realize it, uh, string blocks like 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 Fender guitar string, you know, uh, tremolos. Sometimes the way the strings go into the string block is shallow. In other words, it goes right up close to the bridge. So you're only about an inch of string past where it bends on the saddle and goes down. Sometimes they're longer and it goes two inches to an inch and a half. Changes it. Believe it or not, that's sometimes when, why it feels different. There you go. Um, guitar 1952 says that is why I overwrap my Les Paul guitars. Absolutely. Like I said, there's, there is, there is things that I, I found that are interesting, uh, to, to look at, right. To me, it's interesting to look at, let's say a bunch of uh, guitar players. Okay. And to me, when you see a country guitar player and you see a metal guitar player that don't know each other, that never met each other, that don't have any of the same connections and any of the same music and any of the same guitars, yet have a, come to the same conclusion about the way something feels on a guitar, that really starts illustrating something to you. You know what I mean? And you start noticing things like that. There's reasons why guitars, um, uh, you know, why like I said, where the strings are placed on a guitar is different. String through body versus top mount versus... Like I said, how how deep the top mount is, uh, or how deep the string through is, versus how long, how extended the two piece bridge is, why tremolos affect, all that stuff comes into play. So, um, okay, let's go to the next one. <laughs> Hold on. And by the way, uh, I'm gonna. It's uh, we're an hour and a half in. So any more super chats after? I'm gonna say the last one right now. Hold on. And then, um, like I said, so I, I can't do any more past that because otherwise we'll be here for three hours. And not that I don't want to hang out with you guys for three hours. I literally have, won't have a voice. Uh, although the the water drinking before the show has helped immensely and I'm great now. Matt Presley is the last super chat. And then, like I said, that way I can also handle some non-super chats as well. Um, okay, so James. Uh, nope, sorry, we did James. Um, we're doing Shut Up, Let's Talk. Shut up, let's, Shut Up, Let's Talk says, why do you think so many artists are leaving Dean? Yeah. <laughs> Oh man. Okay. So, uh, Dean is, there's a, there's an industry inside joke. That's horrible, but I'll share it with you guys. Uh, it's, and it's true. It says Dean is where artists go to die. Um, and the joke on that is not that there's anything wrong with the Dean guitars brand. It's that essentially artists tend to, tend to run ra rounds and then end at Dean. <laughs> Right. Um, you know, all, uh, let's use, uh, uh, you know, Dave Mustaine, right. You know, he's Jackson. Then he goes to like LTD for like a minute and then he's in Dean. Right. Um, and you see that a lot of t times before, you know what I mean? Where artists go to Dean. Um, and, uh, and here's what I will tell you. Uh, and Deadfish said D Dean sucks. Well, here's what I will tell you about Dean. That's important. Um, Chris Canilla is the artist guy at Dean. If you don't know Chris Canilla, he used to be the artist guy, uh, and you know, are the product manager artist guy at EVH, uh, which was at EVH Jackson. Uh, and I think Charvel, I don't remember if he did all of them. I, I, just, I think he did Jackson and I know he did Jackson and I think he did EVH and Chris Canilla is a cool dude. 
I've met him several times. He's down to earth. You know, um, I enjoyed his conversations. He's a candid upfront kind of dude, at least in my experiences with him. And so, um, I don't think he would be the problem. So, you know, usually that's what happens when a brand starts losing a lot of players. It's usually either not only a policy change within the company, but you know, people leave. That's a really common thing, right? So artists are people. <laughs> I just told you earlier today that I like dealing with to Dario and string joy for strings, um, as not only as companies, but as philosophies is like, you know, it's congruent to me, their philosophies and my philosophies line up. We have the same kind of, you know, goals. We, I like the conversation I have with them. It's a good experience. I like the product. So it all lines up perfectly for me. Um, you know, if I don't like the way a company operates or I don't like the person, it makes it hard. Even if I like the product, you know what I mean? So, and so on. So it's like I've said before, PRS, Jean at PRS, she's just, amazing. She's super nice. And she, she was one of the first people I've said this before a million times and not because Al John still might be out there somewhere in this viewer audience. Um, Al John and Jean were the two people that I've ever talked to in the industry that I thought got this, this 1289 people hanging out on a Friday talking about whatever the hell we just talked about for the last hour and a half. Um, that could literally bore to tears half the guitar players on the internet, right? The fact that we're this, this, we're into this and, uh, it, you know, they got it. They get us. Um, it's just like, you know, a Comic-Con thing, right? Some, some artists get Comic-Con and some artists think that, you know, it's stupid. Um, so that being said, um, I don't think Dean has that problem. Just in my personal opinion, I don't think it's an artist thing. I think it's just um, opportunities. I think these guys got opportunities. Uh, you guys mentioned Michelangelo Badio. I think Michelangelo Badio, and again, I don't know. I don't know, but I maybe I'll reach out to him. Maybe I'll answer if, if it's that something you guys care about enough. I'll reach out. He's a nice guy. I've interacted with him briefly many years ago, and he's always been very kind. Um, I think him going to uh, Sawtooth is an opportunity of. Uh, it looks like perceptually to me more money. Um, he might have a stake in the company, which looks like what happens. And let me tell you, the the sponsorship gig is is not a high pay gig. <laughs> okay, you got to move a lot of crap stuff. <laughs> you got to move a lot of stuff to make any money. Um, a sponsorship gig could be six percent. That's a good deal. Six percent um, of the of the amount that gets sold to the dealer. The so you know, see what I'm saying? So you know. I mean, it's not a lot. And how many, you know, in a lot of artists, in my opinion, and I've said this to artists who are friends of mine, I've said this personally, so, you know, so you know, I would never say anything I wouldn't say to a friend and vice versa. Um, some of these guys have $3,000 guitars. How many things, how many $3,000 guitars do you think these off-brand guys with these artists are, are selling? You know what I mean? Uh, not a lot. <laughs> not a lot. So 6% 6 of the 2100 well, let's do the math. Yeah, 6% of the $2,100 of 10 guitars sold in a year. I mean, that's, you know, that's a that's not even an exaggeration. Now, that's not everybody's case, okay? But just because I, I want to, I'm going to say a dozen guitars, okay? $25,000, okay? That's the that's the deal. So 1500 bucks for the year. That's your check for your sponsorship deal. It's not really exciting. So sometimes you find better opportunities. Look, we already seen it happen with other artists. We seen uh, we seen um, Marcus Miller. He left Fender and he started his own brand, Sire. You know what I mean? Um, I think that's opportunity. We saw Flea do it for a, a minute, right? Remember he he was with uh, Modulus and um, well, he's a music man. He was with Modulus, but he had a signature guitar with Modulus. Left Modulus, started the Flea brand of basses. If you guys don't know, just Google those. They're probably on Reverb right now. Flea basses, and then left Flea. Uh, Flea basses was a disaster. Not his fault, but it was a disaster. Um, I, I think he got in the in, in business with the wrong guys that didn't know how to do it. That's just my opinion or, or my perception of it, not my opinion, my perception of it. And then he's back at Fender. So I think with uh, that's exactly what it is. Uh, it's opportunities, right? So the opportunity for Michael Angelbedo is maybe he's got a partnership in the company. Maybe he gets a piece of the percentage of the company. Maybe he gets a better deal. There you go. So that would make sense to me why he would leave Dean. He leaves a more premium brand for a sub brand, but he has more control. He gets more money and, you know, it's a better fit for him. Uh, and, and obviously with Dean, obviously leaving Dean, we're going to have to talk about Mustaine. Well, if Dave Mustaine leaves Dean for Gibson. Uh, that's a no brainer. I mean, you know, that's just a no brainer. It's like Tiger Woods leaving Buick <laughs> for Mercedes. 
if that's not a great analogy, I don't, I don't know. Maybe I'll give it Ferrari, whatever. To go from a less premium brand, and there's nothing wrong with Dean by any means, but let's be honest, Dean is not Gibson just by sheer volume and numbers. You know what I mean? Not to mention, you got to understand distribution, sales. You know, uh, I just told you guys, think about what I just said. I'll tell you again, something I would tell a friend. And if I tell a friend, it's, it's, it's important. Phil X and I were talking once and he said, he said, yeah, did you see he, this is not this, no, it was, maybe it was 2020 NAMM show when we bumped into each other. He said, you see, I left Framus and I went to, uh, to Gibson Epiphone. And I said, yeah. And he's like, what do you think? And I said, well, obviously I'm friends with the Framus guys, you know, right. But that had nothing to do with it. They have a great fr friendship because uh, I've talked to both Framus and Phil X and they have the same story, which is they're still friends and I believe them. Um, and, uh, he went to Epiphone Gibson and he's like, what do you think? And I go, I think you're going to have twice as much opportunities. And that's just the reality of it. So, uh, and, and I just told you more of you have sent pictures with your, know, your gear shirts with an Epiphone than any other guitar. If I was an artist, I would definitely think about that. <laughs> uh, the power of that and what that brings to you to the table. And at the end of the day, never forget what the, what is it? I don't even have to quote Gene Simmons. Anybody can say this at the end of the day. Remember the music business is a business. These guys have to feed their families and pay for those nice guitars. So that makes sense. So like I said, I don't think I, all that is my long way to say, I don't think there's actually any problems with Dean per se. I think there's just artists that are presented with better opportunities and they're taking them. There you go. Uh, Todd, cause I like, like I said, anytime you guys are talking about the thing we're just talking about, hit that. Todd says, uh, life is too short to be tied to one brand. You know, you, you're not wrong. Okay. You're not wrong. Um, by any means. Okay. And I think that's a, a logic, but you gotta understand too, what, what a brand brings to an artist and vice versa. It's not, it's a two way, it's a two way street. It's not just an income stream for these guys. In fact, a lot of times it's not, it's support. You know what I mean? It's, I fly to, you know, uh, Nova Scotia for a one night show and the guys at Epiphone can make sure there's a guitar for me there. John Mayer, when he was with Fender, um, two times, this is, so I know this is just because again, it's just important two times, uh, Fender cause Fender was in Scottsdale or Fender is in Scottsdale, Arizona. And uh, my store, uh, for, for 12 and a half years, 13, almost 13 years was in Chandler, Arizona. So the distance is a 30 minute drive, 35 minutes. Um, Fender, uh, would sell me things direct as a dealer. Cause I was a large dealer. In fact, I was one of the largest in the state and by dollar volume. And so they would call me up and go, Hey, we have some stuff, you know, here up in Scottsdale. And they, I actually go get it with my truck. I just drive up there and grab it. And two different times I bought amps that John Mayer had played because Fender had, uh, you know, ship them somewhere so that John could play an event, have an amp and then Fender paid to ship the amp back and then sold me a discount and get this. This is what sucks. <laughs> Notice uh, for those listening on the podcast, Phil is smiling awkwardly. Anyways, um, I wasn't allowed to tell the person who bought them. That was the deal. That was the deal. That's what's an NDA. It's called NDA, non-disclosure agreement. The deal is, hey, Phil, would you like to buy this X brand Fender tube amp that you normally pay 400 for? I'll sell it to you for 290 you know, uh, and you can come pick it up. No shipping, no nothing. And obviously it's sold as new, just like demoed, right? But you can't tell anybody that John Mayer played it. Okay. So that's what you did. Because at the end of the day, I want to pay, fill it, feed my kids and pay my bills. And I didn't tell anybody because so, and if I probably now at this point, I probably could tell somebody, but I mean, so if you ever bought a Fender used amp for me that I said was new, but used and it came from somewhere, maybe you should um, reach out to me and I have my wife go through all the invoicing systems and find out if that's what it was. But it was not even just John Mayer. There was other artists, cause especially. So to, to my point is that's another opportunity because imagine what that artist would have to pay to have an amp or buy a backline. There's other, other, uh, I, what I'm just, that's what I'm getting at. There's other, um, there's other benefits to having a sponsorship endorsement deal with a company besides just getting a paycheck from some guitar sold or getting a free guitar to play. You know what I mean? Like I said, cause you already know these guys don't, most of them don't need a free guitar. They have guitars or basses, but, but having support is a nice thing. And, and it's really simple. Uh, and, and I, and I'll say this just because 
I think it's important to be said, and I think it's a cool thing to know. Pete Thorne has his own signature guitar. Pete Thorne has his own signature amp with Sir Guitars and his signature pickups, okay? Um, and I'm not telling you this for sure because, again, I'm not her, him, and I can't tell you his personal business, but I can tell you what I think I understand from conversations with him and other and and just conversation with him. Um, he likes having a signature guitar. It's important to him. He likes having a signature amp. It's important to him. It's important to him that he has this thing that's exclusive to him and that's very cool. And it's something he's worked his ass off his whole life to achieve, to get to that point of iconic status to he plays guitar and he has a signature guitar and it's really cool. And he likes that. And so you know, the reason I tell you why that's cool is to do that, he basically doesn't get other opportunities from other brands, you know, to pay him to demo other guitars or pay him to demo other amps on his channel. And without a doubt, because I'm in the know, because I'm in this business, without a doubt, I'm guaranteeing him, because I've told him this to his face, he can make three times what he makes off that endorsement deal if he would just be start reviewing other guitar companies' guitars and amps on a regular basis. Uh, three times what he makes. But it, that's not what's important to him. So I tell you that story not because I want you to do that, but also because I think that tell, tells you that Pete's got some integrity, which is nice, because he cares and he wants to play the stuff he wants to play. But also, I tell you because, to tell you that not everything is a dollar sign. There's all kinds of reasoning that goes into this decision. And I've talked to so many guitar players over the years. Just like me, I've talked to you guys about, you know, uh, a Phil McKnight, you know, pedal or whatever. And I'm like, I'm not interested in that stuff because I like working with all, all the companies I like working with and not feeling like I, again, have to work with one so much more than the others or one relationship gets so intertwined in a weird way that I can't work with somebody else. Um, David Lee says Pete Thorne is a gentleman. I have met Pete now. I've hung, well, I won't say hung out, but yeah, I've lightly hung out with him three times now. And every time it was a, a very pleasurable experience that I, I loved. Nice guy. Um, uh, yeah. Ben Coombe says Pete, t t th uh, Pete turns down gear to demo every week. Abs well, yeah, I'm telling you, dude, I'm not even exaggerating. I turned down a lot of gear. He turns down insane amounts of gear. <laughs> You know what I mean? I, I look at stuff that I'm not interested in and I pass. I mean, he's literally like, he's very focused on what he likes to do. So, um, uh, okay. And then Jim Simmons, it's uh, something we were talking about earlier and I got to get back to a question. Jim Simmons says the quad cortex is like the helix, but sounds better. In my opinion, check out Pete Thorne and Rabir's videos uh, of it today. I will do that. Um, I will absolutely do that. Okay, now back to some of the, the other questions. Uh, we have Grumpy Mike Guitar says, for the tip jar, or should I say the tone jar, and why not stay healthy? Thank you, my friend. You two stay healthy as well. And uh, Bensonite uh, Products, Bensonite Products says, oh, I know Bensonite Products. Very good products. In fact, I'm going to link you to uh, his bridges. Um, he makes amazing bridges. I have one of his uh, saddles that I have, and I was going to do a Glary uh, Sharp Max with the saddles, and because Glary uses such weird bridge configurations, didn't work. So I'm stuck in this weird, awkward, paused moment in that video. Uh, but Bensonite Products says, and I'll, like I said, I'll put the link to his reverb store. It says, hey, Phil, any advice on reducing the noise floor in a DRRI? I play fairly clean and quiet. Um, and so I'd like it as hiss and hum free as possible. Thanks. Um, no, uh, I have, I'm the last guy to ask. That's like, a, that's like more of a record, like interface recording stuff. What I notice is, is I have the same problem. Sometimes I get hiss and high floor sounds and stuff like that. And I find myself doing the same thing as you just, I'm balancing, you know, input signals, output signals. Um, sometimes the only thing I have is like, you guys can ask me a question about guitars and all kinds of stuff. I'll, I have friends on YouTube that are like more in the studio stuff and they'll, you know, I'll say, Hey, I have this problem. How do I fix it? And they just send me a text back and this is my fix. So, um, I don't know, uh, but I bet you some of the people watching are more in that sound. I, I literally have in my YouTube arena, like I said, for recording, for stuff like this, for videos, I have learned and uh, really, I don't want to say mastered by any means, but I've really learned how to make what I'm doing working through years of ex uh, you know exploring different products and different things. And I've found out how to record what I need to record for the videos. But I, I'll be on, I, like not only honest, but just to be very 
very aware, so you guys are aware. I literally have no, other than making the videos as good as I can make them, I have no interest to learn anything about that stuff outside of that. This is a byproduct that if I was ever like a huge YouTube channel, like if I ever got to the cool level, uh, you know, like some of the big channels where I just do the review and then somebody else edits this stuff and <laughs> records it. And, you know, like the, that pedal show when I, I'm like, when I look at channels like that pedal show, I'm, I mean, obviously I'm super jealous of, of how cool that is that they get to do that. They get to literally, they have a guy who's like, you know, they have a studio guy, you know what I mean? Filming, editing. Um, and it, it, they're lucky that way. I, I'm doing all this myself. So I've learned all to do it as much as I can the best I can and prove it and prove it and prove it. I keep improving like today. Hey, multiple camera angles on live show. It was like a big deal for me uh, to figure out. Um, and, uh, yeah, so there you go. But other, other than outside that, I, I just stay focused on the guitar stuff. Um, James, uh, says, Hey, I have been a bass player for 25 years. I have been playing guitar for two years. I practice every day. When will I feel like I can jam on guitar? So funny enough, I started out on guitar and I stayed on guitar for a very short period of time before I switched to bass. So like you said, you've been playing bass for 25 years. I would say, um, trying to do the math in my head. I think my, my math, I think my numbers are obviously bigger than yours. I think I'm been playing bass for like 30 years? No, not 30. I've been playing bass for like 27 years. Okay, 26, 27 years. Uh, and then guitar, you know, like probably like you, goofing on it around here and there. Um, but I always rem uh, re uh, I always like saying this uh, so it help helps. When I started my YouTube channel, <laughs> the very first videos that are still up today when you watch them, I just, in those videos, started using a pick. Um, if you watch those videos, I, which don't, but if you watch those videos, I think, cause my editing skills were also not that great. So I couldn't edit down stuff. Um, there's at least every video has at least one time where I dropped the pick because I can, I physically didn't know how to hold on to them. I wasn't used to playing a pick. I played fingers for everything. So, um, so in the last couple of years, I just getting used to the pick and demoing with a pick. And the reason I did that is I knew that if I played guitar without a pick, everyone would say something all the time. Um, and what I did was my big mistake. And, and, and this might help you. My big mistake was I played with a pick. I played guitar the way I thought guitar players should play in the videos. And then immediately when I wasn't making YouTube stuff, I was back to just playing guitar with my fingers. And then slowly I realized, no, you have to play guitar. So the reason I tell you that is the long story to tell you this advice. If you want to feel like you can jam on the guitar, you want to feel like guitar, you have to literally commit to the guitar. I kept trying to be a bass player who dabbled in the guitar. You're going to have to stop that. You, you know, you, you really have to, you really have to commit. So yeah, you, I, I, in fact, um, I, uh, I used to just play my, what I knew on bass on the guitar. <laughs> so like I did this one chili pepper song on a guitar and everybody told me it was wrong. And I remember I couldn't figure out why. And if you go back now, it's, I'm playing the actual bass. I'm playing fleas play a uh, part. I'm not playing the guitar player's part. I'm playing the fleas part, but kind of morphed into a guitar lick um, because I didn't want to learn the guitar riff. Commit. That's it. That's how you do it. So when, when you feel like you can jam on the guitar, when you feel fully commit to it. Um, and if you haven't committed to it, I don't have a better answer than that. But I think that's my answer. That was my answer for myself. Hopefully that helps. Uh, Mathis says, hey, Phil. Um, what do you say? Hey, Phil. He says, hey, Phil. Greetings from Sweden. I saw a... Silver Sky Lunar Ice Teardown and saw very little body cavity or pick guard paint or or tape shielding. Why on such a premium guitar with uh, single coil pickups? Okay, so the question now becomes, why does a basically very expensive Silver Sky not have much shielding in them? Um, my well, because again, the guitar should be spec. Look, and and they should be no different than most companies. But that guitar should be spec the way John Mayer's is. That's what happens. Same re reason I did it. Hey, wide cam. Uh, same reason I did the um, the uh, Zach Myers guitar, and I mentioned it. It it's, has pickups that are can be coil split, but the there's no coil split switches. And I mentioned uh, what else? There was something else on the guitar that it had that it couldn't do because uh, they didn't do that. Um, but the point is, is because Zach Myers wants it that way. <laughs> right. Uh, so same thing. I bet you John Mayer's is, uh, that way. 
Uh, or it's not. Maybe John Mayer's not telling them because sometimes that happens too. Artists get guitars. It's, I just don't think that's the case in this, but it does happen. Artists will get a guitar and then have their tech fix things. This has happened. These are their stories riddled through our industry uh, with guitar manufacturers finding that out um, from artists like Jeff, Be- Jeff Beck and stuff where all of a sudden, you know, and he's just an example, but there's so many where the manufacturer finally gets to sit down again after years of making the artist guitar and go through one of the artist guitars and go, oh my God, what's going on with this? Steve I is a perfect example of this. You know, yeah, the ones you buy off the rack in the stores are like his, but he had his tech mod things, right? We already knew he was modding things. He was putting a different spring system in the back of the guitar that wasn't available on the gyms that we were buying. And why? Because he would give his guitar to his tech and his tech would make it play right. So maybe John Mayer doesn't even know. Maybe he hands his strat to the tech and the tech just, you know, copper tapes it out or, or he paints it out in gives it back to John Mayer and he's like, yeah, that's good. You know what I mean? And, and, he, and maybe in his mind, he's like, yeah, well, this is for me for the stadium. Maybe you don't need that. Um, I, I have not had any noise issues with my silver sky, my personal one. No, especially not even compared to strats. So, and I don't know, but I don't, I haven't looked at it, but that would be my guess to your question. Why it's, it's sparse on the shielding is it's definitely not to save money. <laughs> I could tell you right now, it doesn't cost anything for them time-wise and money-wise. Um, I would be really, really shocked. It, I mean, we literally like knocked me out of my chair to find out that that guitar at that price point at, at PRS's level would be trying to penny, you know, save a penny on the guitar. I'm, I, I can't imagine there's no, there's not enough profit in, in a basically Fender Strat for $2,400. <laughs> you know what I mean? And I, and like I said, I say that with, Owning one. I like it, but yeah, I'm not dumb. It's a Fender Strat for $2,400. Okay. Uh, <laughs> all right. Nick says, as a bass player with bands, who also, wait, who also bass guitar, plays guitar? Okay. Hold on back up. He's asking, as a bass player with bands, who also plays guitar? I'm curious if you hung up when it comes to playing guitar. Wait, if you're hung up when playing guitar in a band is the same as mine. I need to reread this question. I don't know why I'm in trouble with it. It says, as a bass player, so he's a bass player with, with bands. So he's got a ba- he's a bass player in bands who also plays guitar and he plays guitar. He says, I'm curious if you, if your hang up. So I think he's talking to, is he talking to James? Uh, hang up when it comes to playing bass guitar in the band, it's the same with mine. Huh. Or he could be talking to me because I talked about earlier being a rhythm player. Um, I don't really know. Uh, so if it's James, that's for you, James, to answer internally. But if it's for me, uh, as a bass player who also plays guitar, I'm curious if uh, your hang-up comes with playing guitar in a band is the same as mine. Um, my hang-up with playing guitar... Look, I ended up being a bass player the same way most bass players uh, end up being a bass player. Uh, I was a failed guitar player. No, seriously. Um, I was playing guitar in a band. Uh, I played a show in a uh, local bar. Another band played at that same bar who I thought was way better. And I remember thinking, man, those guys killed it. And they were really, really awesome to the point where I was like, man, if they had an, uh, uh, something to buy a CD, I'd buy it. They didn't. And then I can't remember what music store, but I was in a music store, maybe feels like a week later, probably months later, saw that poster for the band, the, the, the piece of paper, take a tap, needed a bass player. I literally went down and uh, to an audition, I had a bass, I had a cheap bass, and I plugged, I had a PA because I owned the PA in the band, and I played the bass of the PA, and I became the bass player. And then I was like, okay, that's how I became a bass player. <laughs> I was like, I wanted to be in their band enough to not play guitar. That's how it worked. Uh, the irony of that band is, and I mean this all with respect because obviously, you know, they were good guys. Uh, I was a better guitar player than their guitar player, which we all kind of knew. Uh, so that was kind of a funny thing, right? I was the bass player. He was a great guitar player, but I understand like we would, you know, on merit, I felt like I was a little stronger as a guitar player. And uh, I took the bass player gig because that was available. And that's why I did it. To me, I want to play music. I've never felt the the... I've never felt that like, haha, I stumped you. You know, I, I, I always think funny, fun, that kind of guitar playing, strange to me. The whole, can you play this? You can't. Suck it. I always feel like, play this with me. Like, that's my personality. You know, um, I, I, first time I ever experienced that for real um, was this time when I was playing and somebody jumped in. We were playing together and it was great. 
And then somebody came over and I thought, oh, somebody else is going to jump in. We're all going to play like a jam together. What a great experience. And they were like, C, D, and G, you know, and then they started critiquing what we were playing. And I'm like, well, we're playing what we can play together in a minute. <laughs> um, and uh, here's what I love. There's always a just desserts to this. Obviously, some of these great players are great players, but I find the majority, 60% of these super talented virtuosic guitar players, they're the ones that show up to a group of musicians and go, do you know this? Do you know this? And and they can't do, hey, just start playing and then they jump in. I like to play music with people. I don't care if it's horrible. <laughs> right? I'll play horrible music with a bunch of people I like all day long. No regrets. All right. Uh, well, maybe the audience has regrets, <laughs> but I don't. Um, let's see. Um... Okay, we got to keep going. We got to keep going. Says, uh, my Jim Journey, uh, Jim, G-E-M, like Jim the guitar, so I'm thinking you're a Jim fan, says, hey, Phil, I'd like to be able to play tube amps at home. Is it as simple as buying a load box with an amp and running it into the monitors? Um, it's kind of as simple as that because obviously you can do that. I do it, um, but it does, load boxes, no matter what they say, darken the sound. They change the sound. Changes the experience a little bit too, but... It works. I use my low box. I love it. I don't care if you buy an ox. I don't care what you buy. I've heard it all. When I try it, it works. It's never this exact same, but it gets you close enough to where, you know, right? Close enough for rock and roll. But yeah, you can do that. Um, so yeah, absolutely. Uh, Shay says, I want a Fender Hardtail Humbucker Humbucker Strat with American Deluxe specifications. Do you think a similar Warmoth or uh, a Kiesel Delos would be as good or go for Fender Custom Shop. Okay, so this is a tough thing because when somebody is specific about what you want, you want a Fender, you want it to be the way you want. Here's the reality: you know how to get what you want. So let's let's not let's not let's not get around that. Let's stay focused, okay? Shay, if you want a humbucker humbucker Strat hardtail with American Deluxe Standard and you want that, you know how to get it at Fender Custom Shop. So I know you know that. So that's the easy part. The question is, is it really worth the five grand it's probably going to cost you or more and the waiting list of insanity? Because let's be very clear, a Fender Custom Shop like that, I didn't even look, but I'm going to say if they got it to you in 18 months, I'd be shocked. So it's not even, so it's insane money, insane time. I guess if it's your lifelong dream, it's worth it. <laughs> right? <laughs> you know what I mean? It's like, you got to wait. <laughs> you could have two babies <laughs> in the time they can make this guitar, but is it worth it to you? If it's worth it to you, do that. Now that's the question. So if you can't justify five grand or whatever it's going to cost, cause it's not going to be three grand. There's no way. Okay. That's a custom shop to actually spec the way you want. And five grand might be on the light side. So, you know, um, if the money is a problem, then you have to go to those two other guitars. So it's not even should you, it's you have to, you have no you have no choice. Okay. And then if you don't want to wait almost you know, a year and a half, two years, again, have to. So, so that's the easy part. If you have the money and you have the time, I say, do it. You want it? Do it. Uh, I give you, I'm enabling you. Do it. However, however, <laughs> if you don't, then you got to look at the two other two options. And as a, a fan of both Warmoth and Kiesel, I'd buy the Kiesel every time. Why? Because you don't have to put it together, and it's a good guitar. The Kiesel, the downfall, ready? I have a Delos. It's a great guitar. It's not a Fender. Kiesel will feel like a Sir, a high-end guitar, a polished guitar. Um, uh, I've watched a thousand reviews of Kiesels besides, you know, because I've reviewed them myself, and I hear things from people who say, like, oh, they're not as good as Sirs, or they're not as polished as Sirs. Great. It's possible. Sure. But feel wise, they feel high end. They have a high end feel. That's what Kiesel's going after. It doesn't feel the same way as a Fender. So if the feel is very important to you, you either have to go with the Fender or you got to maybe try to find a warm mouth spec like that. Otherwise, I'd go with the Kiesel. I like Kiesel. I've had good experiences with my Kiesels. I like Kiesels. I'm thinking about buying another Kiesel. I'm definitely thinking about it. <laughs> so again, so there you go. Uh, master, Master Mon something. Seven and a half. Uh, we're talking about seven and a half radius again. All right. Uh, Jazz Master chokes out at the 12 fret. Okay. So he's got a seven and a half inch radius fretboard on a Jazz Master. It chokes out. In other words, when he bends, it's a fretting out is basically what's happening because the string, the radius is obviously radius like a hill because obviously that's what seven and a half means. It's going to be like a, like a hill, like I'm you know, like a, 
like a bump in the road and the string is lower than the center. So when he bends, it runs around just like a boat hitting the beach. Okay. So for that, I'm trying to be as verbal as I can. It says, uh, when bending, unless I set the action above two millimeters. Well, that's why, yeah, that's why you got to do that. Uh, which is higher than I like it. Any advice? Yeah, the advice, uh, I'll tell you uh, what you can do. It sucks. Um, you can radius your frets a little flatter than that so you can plane them down. I've done that for customers. You basically, basically, you're wearing your frets uneven. It's a very not good thing to do. But if you're forced with that, then, you know, that's what you're you're forced with. Um, the uh, Or, you know, what, what a lot of players did in the back in the day, they ripped the frets out and put jumbo fret wire on there real tall and then again, flattened the radius, the fret wire, uh, nine and a half flatter, you know, to nine and a half. And that fixes the problem. Uh, so there's, there's that. But other than that, no, it's, uh, that's the, that's what I said earlier, the seven and a half, if it's right, it's going to feel like butter and it's going to bend great. And if it's wrong, my John Muir silver sky, it's, uh, it's really, really good. And it frets out a little bit around the 12 fret that, that E minor pentatonic, man, just burp. <laughs> just uh, sucks. Um, and, uh, what do I do? I play a little lighter, you know, I adapt to it. You have to adapt. I had to adapt to the guitar or I got to rip the frets out and redo that guitar. And, uh, if I did that, I'd plane it. Well, by the way, if you refret it, you could also play in the fretboard, but it depends on if you have a, a, a gloss fretboard or not. But if you want to go through that hell, um, but yeah, no, that's the problem. Yep. Or you can just buy another neck with nine and a half inch radius. Stick it on there. You can get a Fender Jazzmaster neck, I think. It's pretty easy. Go to Stratosphere. Find it. It's out there. That'd be my advice. <laughs> so it's going to be cheaper and easier than anything else. Um, what was the last? <laughs> oh, Presley. Okay. All right. Uh, we have... What do we have? We have... Joe, what does Joe want to talk about? Joe says, Phil, want to play punk rock metal on my jazz bass? I'm thinking about installing the EMG J, J set. Any suggestions? Uh, yeah, well, you know, punk rock, man. Okay, so punk rock, you don't need EMGs. They're great, though. For You know, they're great. But punk rock, man, just nasty, gnarly, do what you want, play it how you, it, you know, whatever, just I'd leave the stock pickups in there and just go, right? Um that's what I would say for punk rock. However, you said metal too. Yeah, EMGs. Sure. I like Bartolini's as well, but I mean, EMGs, sick. I think EMGs in, in a jazz bass are magic. You would be very happy with those for sure. Matt says, what is your opinion on the Warmoth necks with the side adjustment for the truss rod? Is that a gimmick or is it legit? Does it affect the tone? No, 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 no. <laughs> it doesn't affect the tone. It's, it's a legitimate idea. If you guys aren't familiar with this, essentially... Um, Warmoth makes necks with a side adjustment to the truss rod. Now it's been, it feels like <laughs> I'm going to five years. I, I'm, I'm, I'm really, I'm going to say 2016. So 2016 is probably the last time I adjusted a, a customer's Warmoth guitar. It's the last time I put, worked on one, you know I mean? I just haven't seen one in years, uh, come through. Um, but before that, you know, you'd see them more and often. I just haven't seen as many, um, in the recent years. Uh, and the way that it usually works is there's, uh, there's, uh, two adjustments on the neck. So there's one on the back, uh, on the back of the ne neck, on the bottom of the neck. And that's the adjustment where you adjust it kind of like, you know, where in kind of like a fine tuner on a Floyd Rose, right? You kind of just, you tune it with the pegs. And then once it's tuned, it, you locked it down, you can fine tune it. The side truss rod adjustment on the warm up neck is that fine tuned thing. Um, I used to, and the reason why I used to see more of them, I think it's because the, the YouTube wasn't as big as it is now. Um, customers would have frustrations because they would literally buy a warm off. They would adjust the side thing and it's like, oh, it's still, it's got too much relief or it's still, it's wrong. And I go, yeah, it's because the side one only goes so, travels so much. You can only do the micro adjustment. So you set the main adjustment with the neck off like an old vintage uh, guitar and then put it on, install it, and then you can do the micro adjustment on the side. No, it's not a gimmick. It's a great way to fix that particular problem. Uh, and I think it's a really cool idea. Um, and I don't, you know, but I understand they gave, probably gave them a piece of paper to read about that and they just tossed it and then came into the, you know, having set it up. Um, so there's that. Does it affect tone? No. I mean, I don't know. I, you know what I mean? I can't see where it would. That's one of those things where I guess if we did a test and we A-B'd it and we'd be like, oh, 
It's one percent different, but I I don't really nothing I've ever noticed. But a cool idea. I like the idea. It was one of the first things I've seen in years. The only thing about it that kind of sucks now is since then, the spindle truss rods have been the big thing. And I think they're freaking amazing. To me, having an Allen wrench adjustment or a socket wrench to adjust your truss rod is sucks. <laughs> you know what I mean? I, I love that we have the spindle now. Just stick a stick in there. Turn it. I've said this many times. When they do it right, you can't even screw them up. How cool is that? You can't hurt those things because what happens is they turn and they only go so far before the 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 thing hits the 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 base, you know, where the body meets the neck, and it's fantastic. It's just a great device. I 100% love them, and wish they would find them way in every guitar ever from now on. <laughs> so easy. Um, Okay. Patrick says, Hey Phil, I just want to let you know that as an inspire, aspiring creative, your attitude and channel are a huge inspiration to me. Keep up the great work, uh, and get that Sarah Longfield Strandberg. Oh man. Yeah. It's been a while since we talked about that. I still want the Sarah Longfield Strandberg and still the problem is 2,500 bucks. I'm still just, you know, I'm still not there yet. So a lot of, it's a lot of juice for that guitar. I know it's, it's not because it's made in Indonesia. So, you know, I have no issue with that anymore. Kind of what little issues I used to have about that stuff is kind of shed it off a little bit. My issue now is I know I won't play it all the time. It's just, it's because the Strandbergs, if you're a Strandberg, Strandberg player, you are a Strandberg player. It becomes a thing for you. I love playing them. They're fun. It's a, how do, it's, it's really, that's what it is for me. How do I justify that much money for a thing that's just fun? <laughs> it's a fun thing to do. It's like, you know, to me, it's like buying a jet ski right now. That's what that guitar is, like buying a jet ski. It's like, I uh, might use it, <laughs> but I can't justify it. But great. Thank you uh, for the nice compliment, by the way. Regan says, uh, super chat in celebration of new guitar day. Squire Squire. Uh, Starcaster first semi. So you got the Starcaster semi. I am going to be reviewing a semi hollow Squire soon. I bought one for the channel new to review because I thought it looked really cool. I, um, uh, I've been asking patrons if there was any kind of cool guitars and I've been listening to their suggestions and looking at guitars to get for the channel because like I said, not every company sends stuff out and, and I can't buy everything. There's just no, no physical way that can happen. But sometimes I can actually get my hands on stuff that's, you know, reasonably priced and give it a review and, and, uh, check it out. And that's one of them. So I'm glad you had a new guitar day day. And I'm actually curious as well about the semi hollow squires old man, Fran, says played nylon strings for 20 years. Oh no, he played nylon strings 20 years ago. Stopped, picked up an Affinity Strat in 2009, uh, 19, sorry. Love it, but sometimes sounds harsh. Is it the pickups or is it me used to uh, nylon? Uh, no, it can sound harsh because obviously if you got a Squire Affinity, it has ceramic pickups. Uh, they're not using El an Elnico uh, 5 or a 2 magnet in those ceramics really got a lot of punch. You know, something you can do really cheap to make it just, mm, just really sing. And especially with those higher, you know, more aggressive magnets and those pickups, get yourself some, uh, blue, uh, blue, get yourself some nickel strings. They got to say pure nickel. Okay. Um, strings. So you can get them from DR. They're called pure blues, I think, or blues, something like that. You can get them from Fender. You can get them from Daddario. You can get them from any major brand. It's a string. I think Stringjoy has them as well. Uh, so you want to get ones that are, like I said, they have to say a hundred percent nickel or pure nickel, not nickel plated. Originally electric guitar strings, uh, that were nickel were nickel, pure nickel. Um, and so obviously the nickel, is um it's not as magnetized or mag it's not e as easy to read i don't know how i'm trying to say this i'm sorry guys we're at the end of the two hours and i start losing my train of thought on this basically what i'm trying to say is it's going to soften the tone i have a video about it going through the technical way it works what it will do is the pickups will just have a softer sound because again the magnetic field is not as strong with the pure nickel versus nickel plated over steel it's a very inexpensive purchase. You could probably pick up a set for $10 from any brand that's worth it. 10 bucks, old man friend. You can restring your guitar. I promise you, if you don't love it, I can't promise you'll love it, but I can promise you you'll hear a difference. I promise it. When we're talking about tone chasing and you can't hear it, those you will hear. You'll hear it instantaneously. It's it definitely, and it has a nicer feel to it. Different. The only reason not to buy pure nickel is if you want the brighter attack or if you want to snap to the string, you lose a little bit of that. But it sounds to me like you're okay with that. So let's do that. 
Uh, Waterford Giant says another great hour plus spent. Thank you. Thank you. I appreciate it. Thank you uh, for hanging out in the super chats. Very kind of you. Tinkerbell. Hey, Tinkerbell says uh, uh, straight up, bro. <laughs> the time you took making your tech vids uh, made me a better player. Thanks for that, uh, for the cause and for metal. Okay. That's just cool as hell. That your name's Tinkerbell and you're into metal. <laughs> Tinker hell. Tinker hell. That's just all right. Uh, Tony says, uh, I purchased a Sam at Greg Bennett. Wow. Great quality. Thinking about a hollow body, uh, 90 now 97. Um, it looks like it's a uh, $650. I think that's what I'm getting on this. Have you ever reviewed a Sam? I have not reviewed a Sam, but I have worked on and played many, many Sam, especially Greg Bennett. Greg Bennett, uh, was a designer at Washburn guitars. Uh, very designed a lot of great guitars and then literally went to work. And this is, again, if you Wikipedia, there's probably details that I'm just glossing over. This is a very broad history stroke off of a memory. <laughs> uh, Greg Bennett, of course, uh, you know, worked for Samick designing guitars for them. So of course, Samick like court guitars makes so many guitars for so many companies that make great guitars. There's no question about how good they can make a guitar. They make so many guitar brands and they make, you know, millions of guitars. But Greg Benner, as a designer, as as someone who can you know get the product idea into fruition, uh, was a good a good good good. Um, I don't know what I'm trying to say. Good meetup? No, it was a good collaboration. <laughs> like I said, we're at the end. We're at the end. I got one more. It's Matt Presley. Matt says no question. Just support. Love the channel. You know what's great, Matt? Is now I can do a non super chat uh, since I cleared those out and do. Uh, let me find somebody who's got a good last question and we can end the the show on. Um, uh, oh, and a couple questions, a couple statements on the, uh, Squire with affinity. Somebody was saying lower the pickups. You can do that as well. However, however, with a strat, you can lower pickups, but generally what you want to do is always lower the base side and let the treble side be more aggressive with the more aggressive magnet. You can still lower them. However, it's changes the tone in a different way. So I, it's free to do that. It takes seconds to do that. So it's a great suggestion. I love the idea. However, I really feel strongly that the, even though it's $10 versus free, I, I would love to do a test. Maybe I could one day, but I'll, I promise you the nickel strings will just kill and tone wise, there'll be a sweetness to the tone, not just a back off of the signal output, which is a different kind of thing, right? It's different difference between a hot signal and a fuller sound is basically what I'm trying to get at. Um, All right, let's. <laughs> BC Rich. Okay, we're going to end on this comment because I just, it's great. <laughs> I love it. Uh, BC Rich 581 says, Phil actually thumbs, I know you're talking to each other, but I know what you're talking about. He says, Phil actually thumb slaps uh, and pops on the guitar. I tried it and broke the high E string. Okay. Why I wanted to read that is I do have a video where I show you guys how I slap and pop on the guitar. I, I obviously am a bass player, so I just took what I do on bass and I did it on guitar. And what I love about that is I say it so many times in videos, and I don't know if I hit it enough in those videos, but I've said it and I'll say it again now. When you see me slapping and popping, I've done illustrations even on um, on Marty Schwartz's channel where I show I have a video called How to Play Slap, slap Bass on Marty Schwartz's channel. And... I show you that I can take the pinky like this and slap bass. I slap bass with my pinky, just like a thumb. And no one believes, I think, <laughs> until like BC Rich says, until he's till, till he broke a high E string, how light I'm really hitting. When I went, when I say I'm hitting the strings and I'm plucking lightly, I promise you, because if you don't, you will break the strings. I am very, very light touch. It is super, super. Matt says, Phil has a super light touch. I do. It's very light. It's it's all, it's because, like I said, when musicians spend, just like musicians spend time convincing you what they're doing is not hard, right? Musicians spend time, after you perfect, I don't want to say ever perfect, that sounds egotistical. After you get a technique down, then the next step is to show people how you basically can do it effortless, right? And so on a guitar, I'm never going to, I've never, I've never gotten to the level where I can try to pull anything off effortlessly. Everything's like, oh my God, I just did that. That's pretty cool. Um, but on the bass, I do feel like I've, I've not, I've accomplished enough to where I can play the bass and make you think that it's not as hard as I am playing and I am, or, you know, difficult and I am doing that. Um, and, um, that's just hours, the hours in play and practice. Um, 
<laughs> right. Um, all right. On that note, D Mitchell said it best. Thank you, moderators. Thank you, moderators, so much as always. Thank you guys for hanging out. I know we hit like thirteen hundred and something. You guys are killing it. By the way, last week's show again, another record had like seventy thousand views on the live show. It was insane, and the same the podcast rebroadcast was insane. These numbers are crazy. I appreciate it so much. I hope you guys enjoyed it. I hope uh, I hope it was fun for you. It was definitely fun for me. Um, I hope you guys have a great week. I can't wait to see you next Friday. I know it sounds weird because I don't see you, but I can't wait to stare at my face talking to you, I guess. <laughs> On that note, I'm going to let you guys go. And this time, I'll actually end the show by hitting the button the right way. All right, guys. As always, thank you for your time and know your gear. <laughs>